So welcome everyone to the Union Budget 22-23, an in-depth analysis presented to you by the Bengal Chamber of Commerce and Industry and Druva Advisory. So here with, uh, here with us we have Mr. Abraham George Stephanos, the President of the Bengal Chamber and Managing Director of Tata Steel Downstream Products Limited and Mr. Dinesh Kanabar, CEO of Dhruva Advisors LLP. So I would request Mr. Stephanos, the President of the Chamber, to please share the Chamber's overview. Good morning, viewers. The Bengal Chamber is delighted to present the annual Union Budget Analysis in partnership with Dhruva Advisors LLP this year. Our focus in today's discussions is to understand the Union Budget 22-23 from the perspectives of economy, taxation, and also reactions from the industry. Backed by robust revenue collection and mass vaccination drives, this budget is an exercise in continuity and has renewed stress on infrastructure and inclusive growth. A special feature has been the focus on the digital economy, including announcements of the 5G spectrum, digital currency, taxation of digital assets, and uh, initiatives for dig digitalization of education, agriculture, and also G2C services like e-passports. Bharat Net Broadband has also been announced to be ready by 2025. These commitments are in line with the announcements made by the Honorable Prime Minister Narendra Modi at the United Nations COP26 summit in Glasgow. The low carbon development strategy that the Honorable Prime Minister announced was an important reflection of the government's strong commitment to sustainable development. Four pilot projects for the conversion of coal to energy, along with an additional allocation of 19,500 crore rupees to facilitate domestic manufacturing to boost 280 gigawatts of installed solar capacity by 2030 are significant moves. The allocation to the PLI incentive and PLI scheme for manufacturing high efficiency modules for polysilicon will boost India's solar capacity. In this context, I must mention that India also hosts the International Solar Alliance following its commission to in COP21. Announcement of sovereign green bonds for funding green infrastructure is a welcome move. The issue of sustainability has also been addressed in the union budget. For developing India, India's specific knowledge in urban planning and uh, design, and to deliver certified training in these areas, up to five existing academic institutions in different regions will be designated as centers of excellence. And these centers would be funded with uh, endowments of rupees 250 crore each. The Ministry of Rural Development has also been allocated uh, rupees uh, 1.4 lakh crore. And an additional 60,000 crore has been allocated to the Har Har Jal scheme. Infrastructure is at the center point of this year's budget. And uh, this is likely to give a boost to job creation. As part of the Prime Minister's uh, Gatti Shakti Master Plan, Honorable Finance Minister proposed 50 year interest free loans of rupees 1 lakh crore to the states to help them attract investments in the financial year 22 23. These loans are over and above the normal borrowings allowed to the states. The scope of these loans go beyond just Gati Shakti to address digital platform to ta tackle infrastructure projects powered by seven engines, airports, ports, roads, railways, mass transport, waterways, and logistics. Startups have also been encouraged by announcement of their involvement in developing a suitable ecosystem to manufacture drones. Further, the government also intends to provide support to startups that are involved in defense R&D and sunrise opportunity sectors such as artificial intelligence, geospatial systems, semiconductors, genomics, and green energy. 
Regulatory hurdles have also been eased for startups, including tax benefits. That being said, questions still remain about addressing rising inequality, helping the common taxpayers, and thus positively impacting demand. There is also no visible stress on healthcare, especially during the pandemic times. Therefore, senior citizens may be harder. Further analysis will bring to the forefront the finer details of the budget. And today's program is one such step towards understanding the, these nuances with a panel of experts sharing their views. Thank you all for joining, and I now hand it over back to Angana to take it forward. Thank you, sir. So we would now request Mr. Dinesh Kanawa, CEO of Druba Advisors LLP, to share the expert's comments on the Union Budget 2023. Uh, good morning, and uh, thank you for having me on this webinar. Uh, delighted to see a number of uh, familiar faces uh, out here, uh, Mr. Praveen Sood, Mr. Somani, uh, thank you all and a very good morning to all of you. Um, when, I, when I look at the provisions of the union budget and then subsequently I had a look, closer look at the provisions of the finance bill, a, a few things stand out. First, this was a rare time when the finance minister was presenting a budget with the corporate tax collections ahead of the target. Normally it is behind the target, but it was quite ahead of the target. We had, it was 24% in excess of the budgeted revenues. The GST collections for the last month came in at a lakh and 40,000 crore plus, which again was something very, very positive. Overall fiscal deficit, while it has slipped to almost 6.4%, uh, it was almost budgeted at 6.38, went to 6.39, so neither here nor there. And this is a time where one is not worried too much about the fiscal prudence, but one about the growth. And I, I remember just same time last yesterday, uh, I was asked a question on a pre-budget panel on CNBC, that what should be the big expectations from the budget? I think all of us unanimously agreed that there were three things which you were looking from the budget. One is a big infrastructure spend. Second is measures to revive the CAPEX cycle. And third, from a tax perspective, please leave us alone. Don't make any more changes. You are taxing us enough. Uh, we don't need anything more. And if I may dare say, all these three things were addressed in an abundant measure by the finance minister. We had unprecedented announcements with regard to spend on infrastructure. We had some unprecedented announcements on revival of the CAPEX cycle. There is indeed this question, and we can't answer this today. Maybe same time next year, we'll have a better sense as to whether the government will go ahead and implement all the announcements. But we have had a series of announcements. The president spoke about just now about some of those. So whether it is a PLI scheme being announced for green energy, 18,000 crores being earmarked for that. Um, construction of roads, construction of ports, everything else where we heard some very, very major announcements. And I think the government spending is very, very key at this point of time to revive the CAPEX cycle. And if indeed the government implements what it has spoken about, one will see the revival of CAPEX cycle. If we have the revival of CAPEX cycle, you are gonna see employment being generated, something which is a grave concern to all of us. Uh, and, and that should spear the economy forward. The finance minister's, of course, own mantra is that she is laying down this budget as a base for the next 25 years. Uh, only time will prove how that goes, but all the steps taken are in the right direction, and if implemented well, would mean a lot. My colleagues on this call uh, will take you through the finer print of each one of the provisions of direct and indirect taxes. But I do want to share some broad thoughts on where do I see the proposals, what do they mean directionally, and where will they take us as we go forward. The first is the radical introduction of what I may call as a settlement scheme within the Income Tax Act. The provision regarding updating of tax returns. So we already have today provisions under which if you have filed a return and you find some error or omission, 
you can revise that return that continues as it is that is for arithmetical error something which you have missed out etc etc but let us assume that you filed your return and now the time limit for completing tax assessment has been shrunk drastically and in the course of assessment proceedings the tax officer comes and has a view different from yours with regard to taxability of some item where something should be taxed disallowed whatever then what the law provides is that for a period of two years you can update your return which is different i repeat from revision of return for errors you can update your return and you can include further income that's all that you can do and that income you can pay the tax normal tax you can pay the interest and you can pay an additional tax of 25 percent if such a revision happens in the first 12 months 50 percent if the revision happens between 12th and 24th month and once this has happened then the return will be deemed to be a valid return and you will not be liable to penalties and long drawn litigation <coughs> so sort of telling that so long as you are paying your normal tax and an additional tax we are happy not to prosecute you we are happy not to penalize you and we are happy to sort of accept your return and move on with life a very very welcome provision uh, as to whether 25 percent additional tax is sufficient uh, incentive all of that can continue to be debated till cows come home but there was always this request to say there has to be a mechanism where taxpayers can settle their dispute rather than go on litigating for 20 years and this is a step in the right direction we then have provision for taxation of digital assets and of course uh, we would have seen in the newspaper today there is a big amount of debate as to whether by putting in this tax we are legitimizing cryptos and clearly the answer is no uh, income tax is a tax on any income uh, uh, it, even if an income is earned from an illegitimate source it is liable to tax etc so what the government has done is that while they are trying to build a consensus between the reserve bank of india ministry of finance on how crypto should be regulated they'll come back to say in any case we need to tax income and they have created a separate block for taxation of crypto it will not be taxed as normal income it will be taxed at 30 percent on a gross basis without deduction of any expenses just like we have speculation income etc and you cannot set off losses from other sources of income against crypto income in fact there is also a provision and the, the wordings are not very happy but if you read the, the the section as it is it gives an impression that even loss from one of the type of digital asset cannot be set off against income from another type of a digital asset so for example if you have income from cryptos and loss from nft there is a possibility the way this is worded is you may not be able to set off one against the other as to whether 30 percent is a right tax why should crypto be taxed on a higher base again is a matter of debate we can talk about it but the, for the first time there is an acceptance of income arising from crypto and a way to tax it and take it forward we then have series of other changes so fortunately as i mentioned earlier no increase in rate of tax rather the only one tinkering about the rate of tax is a reduction which is reduction of capital gains tax long-term capital gains tax on unlisted security where now the surcharge has been reduced to 15 percent as a result of which effectively the tax goes down by about four and a half percent which is very very welcome uh, I, i'm sure this is a step in the right direction could there have been an enhancement of standard deduction sure it could have been should there have been an increase in the uh, basic threshold for taxation maybe yes that would have given a boost to consumption but none of that has happened the government has sort of stuck to status quo uh, and which is of course one way to approach one should not go on tinkering around rates another welcome provision has been that if you are a new manufacturing company you are required to set up your machinery your plant uh, manufacturing facility by 31st march 23 to avail of a concessional rate of tax of 15 percent thanks to covid people could not complete the setting up of the manufacturing facility and there was a request that this date be extended it has been extended to 24 again a very very welcome thing 
the not so welcome things and again as i mentioned my colleagues uh, will take you through them uh, are some of the provisions with regard to for example reopening of tax assessments where now an officer does not need to take permission from his senior and can reopen tax assessment or for example the fact that you can do a reopening even on an audit objection you don't need to really um, uh, have any prove any reason as to why you did a reopening not something which is welcome at all i don't think those are the sort of uncertainties that one wants to create uh, we have had extension of uh, the powers of the commissioner to reopen in certain circumstances and we'll go through all of them i do wish that while on the one hand the government is talking about trusting the taxpayer if at the same time you bring on these provisions you are not demonstrating trust finally on indirect taxes an enabling provision has been put in which is a cause for grave concern as you know gst is a pass through tax you collect and you pay and you set off what you have to pay uh, uh, against whatever you already have a credit a uh, enabling provision has now been introduced to say that input credit can be restricted and not be allowed to be fully set off against output tax uh, this is a only an enabling provision the percentage and the situations have not been provided but i have seen in the past over my decades of experience as a tax professional that once you introduce such a provision they take a life of their own and i wish that the government does not really tinker with the basic tenet of gst law which is to make it pass through so we have a number of provisions some good some not so good and I, and i'm very sure that my colleagues will take you through each one of them and then we'll be happy to answer question and answers thank you so much and i hand over back to you thank you sir thank you and we will now move on to the economics perspectives on on the budget and the discussions would be moderated by professor dr ajita bhurai choudhury chairperson of economic affairs committee of the bengal chamber and professor of economics and former head and coordinator center for advanced studies department of economics of jadavpur university uh, we have uh, as panelist mr tomal bondopadhyay uh, author and columnist and he was also the mentor of the banking and finance committee of the chamber and dr bishwajit mondol associate professor department of economics and politics bishwabharati university so i would request professor dr rajita horai choudhury to please take the discussion forward thank you very much angona i welcome you all uh, for this morning seems to be a quite a bright morning uh, although there is a, a possible chance of rain but right now we are in a very bright spot outside so hopefully inside also we'll have some bright discussions fruitful discussion and uh, in fact uh, we have very eminent speakers uh, mr tomal bondobadhyay know him for quite some time very eloquent speaker very analytical mind and i'm quite sure we'll learn quite a bit from him and i have bishwajit mondol who is also a very young and bright economist uh, who also uh, takes interest in the budget and uh, economic issues of india uh, which has become kind of rare now for young economists they are more interested in theory rather than practice well just to uh, you know uh, the, the 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 way i want to do it is i want to give freedom to the uh, speakers i mean i don't want to limit them to you talk about tax you talk about finance you talk about uh, infrastructure etc 10 minutes i want to give them and 10 minutes is strict 10 minutes i don't want to make it 8 minutes then 1 1 10 10 and i will just uh, ring the bell uh, and um, then we will have some discussion we will have about 7 uh, 8 minutes time for discussion so i request all the authors to speak to this just to initiate it uh, as you know the budget this time has uh, spoken about very clearly in its goal gati shakti that the infrastructure i call it a continuity budget in the sense the infrastructure is talked about in the last budget as well and it has got a real philip this time then you have this uh, inclusive growth this has been talked about as a second prominent goal and i would say this is also somewhat uh, 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 oft repeated term uh, nowadays sabka saath sabka vikas i i think it's basically inclusive growth is nothing but that then you have this uh, you know something like a green economic development 
in the sense that after this COP22, uh, India is uh, uh, somewhat held responsible for scuttling some of this, uh, unjust, I would say, to a certain extent. And I think this uh, stress on green, how much and whether sufficient, our experts can talk about that. And uh, uh, then, uh, you know, this uh, crowding in, public capital is needed because that will crowd in the private investment. That's another thing which has been talked, four major goals. And then you have all these proposals which we have seen on the expenditure side, on the revenue side. And I just don't want to talk about that right now. I want to listen to what uh, Mr. Bandabadha and Dr. Mondo talk about. And let's uh, go ahead and let's have uh, Mr. Bandhapadhyay to begin with. Uh, Mr. Bandhapadhyay, you have 10 minutes, your freedom on whatever right, you sir. want to talk, but please keep to the time, 10 minutes. Absolutely. Okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you uh, Professor Rai uh, So, you know, I, uh, as all of us are, are aware, I don't think no country in the world uh, be developed or emerging markets give so much of importance to budget because budget is simply nothing when you, what you do the accounting thing. I remember, you know, in my childhood, my mother was the finance minister at home. So in every uh, early first day of the month on the, on the book, she will put on the left hand side what my father will bring and on right hand side for milk and education, so on and so forth. And there was always a gap what my father used to bring and what was the suspend. Then father used to ask, where do I get the money? It's your exceeding that. Then my sister, you have to find out some ways. Then my father was a writer and does some accounting work, etc., etc. That's how that's how it was like that. And later, when my brother got a job and we are relatively better off from lower middle class to middle class, then my mom's uh, budget started changing. I found that she was not only talking about this; she was also talking about keeping some money for my sister's marriage for my education, so on and so forth. And what the country does also same thing in the family. If you see the last year, the uh, finance minister spoke about 10 years budget. And this year, it talks about 25 years budget. India taking 20, so Amrit Kal. So which means that it, it gives a sense that we have arrived, we have so much of wealth we have, we can chart out this and all. But and every you know corporate honchos on television channels, I was watching them and they were gushing over that. They are very happy. It's only 90 minute budget and all marvelous ingredients. It's all recovery, relief to stress sectors, and of course reforms, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I have sir a slightly different point of view on that. Yes, uh, there are because the, I think one of the main objective was everybody talks about K-shaped recovery to make it formal so which was two very critical aspects it happened one is this that ECLGS the guarantee credit guarantee scheme that has been extended both by size as well as as time from 4.5 it has gone to 5 lakh crore and it it would have ended this March and the, the, this March sanction and by June disbursement it has gone by one more year. and MSMEs which are the most important sector I mean for this budget for for India to grow uh, their contribution to GDP, etc. I'm not wasting time doing that. So MSMEs will get the bigger benefit or not. So that's a great story from K-shape to, to overall recovery. So should we be all now dancing to the party and all of us will join? It's not that only the so-called upper middle class and the large corporates get the benefit, etc. There I find a uh, lot of things. It's, it's just promises. I don't know how it will be I will materialize. Look at the basic thing on which the market is building on is the capex outlay. FY23 has been expanded more than one third, 35.4 percent, from 5.5 trillion to 7.5 trillion. So that much money the government will spend, spend to pop up the economy. And what is this? Is 29 percent of GDP. So government is saying, I will be heavy lifting to pump prime Asia's largest and now the fastest economy, which is already in dollar term three trillion. Our dream is to be two factor. But sir, where will the money come from? This investment is only 65,000 crore, which is very realistic 
1.75 trillion which this year we spoke about. So all talk about VPCL, two banks, general insurance, uh, et cetera, et cetera. I don't know where they are there. Second part, the gross borrowing program, 14.95 trillion, highest ever. Every year it is going up. It's a new normal now. Uh, two, three, four years back, it was half of it. Now, it, and uh, after the so-called switch, et cetera, it happened now 14.31 trillion. Historic high. Okay. And, you know, the current year's gross borrowing is 12.12, 12, 12, 12 something. So even, even net borrowing, again, it's, it's going up. Current year is net 3.4, 3, 4, 4 trillion, et cetera, which will be some 11, 11 trillion plus. Again, is historic high. Where would the money come from, sir? That's my question. One thing would have been which all of us was banking on that India will get into the bond indices, which means we'll get more demand for Indian currency. RBI had certain reservations because, you know, some geopolitical problem and it can play havoc on your bond on bond bond prices on your equity market on your uh, uh, currency etc cetera, etc cetera. but rbi now little uh, softer on that but there's a problem of tax issue now the global platform where you sell that now there's a tax issue how do you make it capital gains tax versus withholding tax so budget is silent on that which means the entire responsibility will be largely on the banking system to do this. Now, where? Where will it come from? And if you talk about even the capex, the spend, how the money we spend, 7.5 trillion capex, out of which 1 trillion is given to states. Now, states are being told you spend. Where do you spend? It's up to the states. I don't know how much will be spent and all, etc., etc. Other part is this budget is... So budget is completely silent on where the money would come from for for to to support such a huge bond bond i mean government borrowing uh, but it is not so silent about cryptocurrencies i mean it is it is not used the word cryptocurrency in the budget at all but it says it will be taxed on the digital transaction etc etc and it also talked about uh, in fy3 rbi will come out with the digital currency and it very smartly used the blockchain backed by blockchain technology now the so called crypto lobby has been talking about promoting blockchain they were riding on the blockchain they were giving a chocolate in the wrapped in blockchain they they are, they, are, they were misleading us now i think our budget has trying there's a the positive part they have said, look, I mean, blockchain is not only for crypto. Blockchain can be used for RBI currency as well. So that's a good part of it. But in sum, since it's 10 minutes time, I, I would not like to talk more, much more, but very little this thing. It is to, on the positive side, it's, it's for all, no more K-shaped recovery because you are an economist and another economist is there. It will be overall economy. Everybody will grow. Our rickshaw pullers, our pan, pan shop holders, and subji vendors. Everybody will get the benefit. That's the that's the idea. So all of us should join the party, and it's a growth-oriented budget. But inflation will rise because it's an inflationary budget. So will interest rate. Now, talking of the capex, credit will take off. But where will the money come from? Because, you know, this higher government borrowing will crowd out the corporate and retail borrowers. And then you, the economists know there is a so-called hurdle, hurdle effect, which is called hurdle rate, which means the rates will go up. As we speak, during the budget day, 10-year paper, for a briefly, yield rose to 6.88%, highest since September 2019. So yield will rise. Banks' deposits will rise. And if you see the how much the bank's deposit growth every year, I'm not getting into, for the time, getting into the number and all. And you see the government borrowing. Yes, there are other participants like insurance companies and all. But largely, so government can is saying that I am pump priming the economy. I am heavy lifting. But actually, the left, with the, 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 the job will be left with the banking system for the heavy lifting. And if you do that, then there's a contradiction. Where would the money come from for corporate India, for retail India, so long, so long on and so forth? So the growth push is fine, fine. Promise for higher spend is fine. Equity market has given a thumbs up. 
but if you think there will be a complex in one market will go down yield will go up which means the rises are coming down people will make people will lose but bond market but but equity market will take care of that it's again it's it's, it's it does not work out in a higher interest rate scenario equity market also will face a wall so the market exuberance what you are saying i would like to believe that will not last bond market has already given its idea what is going to happen even in equity market if you think that because of capex it will it will rise and rise and will be very happy will make money no it will not because higher higher interest rate will will have a dampening effect to face a wall so all in all i am not hugely excited about the budget i don't think it is that bold i don't think it is that reformist i don't think it is epoch making not epoch making actually it's a 25 year budget to india to take 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 uh, take 100 uh, to take 200 years i would have thought that there should have been more thoughts got into it stationary and last thing is this i think we saw it in 2018 2008 when pradam mukherjee was the finance minister post uh, uh, you know the global crisis or transatlantic crisis uh, following the uh, uh, us problem we had this that no consolidation no more consolidation on on fiscal path will go and spend on all and it happened quite a few years and to remember sir and the economists to remember inflation was in double digit current account deficit was huge and there was a taper tantrum we faced are we so vulnerable now definitely not uh, because our huge uh, our uh, our um, forex market pity is pretty good and taper tantrum will not be so affected but i have a feeling that probably uh, it is not as rosy as the picture has been has been shown we need to look at between the lines and as we see i see i am getting a little frustrated not as excited as others i end i i, I hope i have not exceeded my time sir sir you are on mute professor rai choudhury you are muted please unmute yourself Professor Rai Choudhury, please unmute yourself. Yes. You cannot hear. Yeah. Yes. I mean, uh, very uh, thoughtful, uh, you know, speech from Mr. Bondapadhyay. Already questions are asked about financing part, and you have answered some of this. Uh, it's still a big question. I mean, you didn't really answer how it should could can be solved. You just raise that it's a big problem. How the things can be done? It's a pressure on banking system, and interest rate might go up, and all these things. Well, uh, let me just go to Dr. Mandal, and uh, ten minutes. Yeah. Good morning. Very good morning to all of you. And I want to, at the very onset, I want to thank you. I mean, Bengal Chamber of Commerce for having me on this show today, and to share some of my ideas with other experts. So I'm just taking clue from what uh, Mr. Bondapada just said. I mean, his story of his family budget reminds me one interesting story of my life, my student life. when uh, professor roshin das gupta was the finance minister of west bengal and he used to present a zero deficit budget in every year so we interestingly asked a question to sir sir can you just tell us whether your family budget is always zero deficit and he was very i mean wittingly replied that oh this question uh, you can ask this question to your kakima your kakima can tell whether you, i have a zero deficit budget in my family or not So essentially, I agree with what Mr. Bondapadhyay said: is that budget is a kind of account of income and expenditure. And if you can recall what uh, Mr. Sanjeev Shannal said after the economic survey, that they are going to have expected to have a kind of agile budget. There is nothing new in it. Budget is always agile. You are. 
placing some proposals and then during the next coming months and years, you are going to change it. So that is why it is always flexible. You need not to mention it, that it has to be agile. But yes, now coming back to what has happened in this budget. Yeah, I, I partly, I probably the more than 50%, maybe 70% agree with Mr. Bandhubadda. Uh, you know, this budget is a kind of long run budget and they are planning for next five years. And I want you to remember one thing, the year the budget is placed, it is 2022, and they are planning for another five years. So the next five year ends in 2027, and the next election is 2024. I'm not going to make any comment on this. You can understand the implication of this budget and the government, what they want to say. But yes, coming to the point that they have said and they have proposed in this budget is that, you know, it's, it's, it's a kind of India at 100. So for next 25 years, what mm -hmm. India can have. So they are planning accordingly and they are targeting to have 60 lakhs jobs. And probably if I'm not wrong, because I'm very poor at memorizing data. So I have noted down a few, but probably it was 30 lakh crores of outputs in five years. Now, to my mind, at this point of time, five years, forget about uh, 25 years, it's a kind of long run. And we as economic students and economics teachers, we all know that there's a very interesting saying by John Maynard Keynes that we all are dead in the long run. So we need to survive in the short run first, then think of the long run. Now, coming to this short run and long run issue, I agree with Mr. Bandapaddai, there is nothing very important in this budget. You can recall that in 1996, there was a catch line between Coca-Cola and Pepsi, nothing official about it. So just if I want to rephrase the stream, I mean, sentence, nothing special about it. Nothing very ecstatic about it. Nothing very exciting about it. So to me, it's eventless. But my point is that eventless thing is not always bad. It is a kind of thing you are just, I mean, carrying forward the bus or the pace or the process that you have started few years ago, and which is not a very easy thing. So to me, it's a kind of balancing act between short run and long run. You need to survive in the short run and then do something and have some policies so that you can have economic growth or economic boom in coming years or in the long run. Now, the point that we have raised in this budget, you know, mainly emphasizing on infrastructure and other issues. You know, from the Purely from economic theory perspective, you have expenditure and you have income, and then you are trying to equate always from the expenditure side, what we can have, you know, the, it could be government expenditure, it could be private expenditure, it could be investment expenditure, it could be export and import. This budget, I'll come to this issue later, this budget almost, I mean, has not said anything about this export, import, or external sector. They mainly emphasized on the infrastructure. But this infrastructure it is also in the line of the programs they have, I mean, declared a few years ago. If you can recall this Make in India budget uh, program, if, if you recall the Skill India program, if you recall what just one year ago they have said that it is self reliant India. So if you Consider all these things together, and then you are emphasizing on infrastructure, means you are emphasizing more on production, and that is from the perspective of government, and this government expenditure on infrastructure will, uh, as Professor Roy Choudhury mentioned in the very beginning, that it will crowd in public investment. It will, uh, sorry, private investment. And in the short term, it may crowd out a little bit, but it will. But you know, so essentially, the government is expecting to have some multiplier effect. And they are expecting to generate some employment through this multiplier effect. Like, you know, creation of infrastructure means road. It could be, I mean, say anything that helps the production process, the marketing process. But unfortunately, to me, what I understood, Professor Rai Chaudhuri can clarify more on this, and he is uh, my teacher as well, because, you know, most unsuccessful economic theory is probably the trickle-down theory. 
the, so it doesn't matter from where it comes, whether it's waterfall theory, sprinkling theory, or trickle down theory, it is very difficult that the development, if it takes somewhere, it will trickle down to the poorer segment. But you cannot forget at this moment that the poorer segment is the most I mean, most vulnerable segment of the society at this moment. But I am not saying that. For the betterment of the poorer segment, you just go for unconditional cash transfer. Because if you go for unconditional cash transfer, there is no guarantee that this cash is going to be spent on the targeted thing, or on the purpose that you want to have. So the government is taking the responsibility to create the infrastructure, and then this will invite some sort of employment now, and once this employment is generated, then this will give you some money income and automatically in the long run, that will generate some demand. So to me, it's a kind of supply side flip. You are incentivizing the supply side through a long run infrastructure creation. And then this will take care of the demand problems. So this is probably, this is there in their mind. And now, yeah. So. Uh, I don't think I have much time uh, so in one or two minutes. How much time I have? Two minutes? Two minutes, sir, yeah. Okay. So the thing is that I expected something more on this external sector because, you know, the thing that I was saying, you know, uh, the export performance uh, in, in the last financial year or fiscal year, it was not very bad. And, you know, it's essentially it is the time to, I mean, uh, capture the vacated place by China. And since the export performance was not bad, it could have gone for more emphasizing on export. And for the time being, we could have thought of uh, uh, again another uh, very interesting and effective policy for economic growth, the trade as an engine of growth, because the competitiveness of some Indian industries, uh, including probably textile industry, is not very bad in the international market. So this, uh, I mean, for direct, incentive to the some sectors could have been uh, i mean very good at this moment and along with this thing a few things i want to say at the, uh, right now and then i will stop uh, so regarding this cryptocurrency uh, i i i i partly agree with what uh, mr kanavar has said already that you know taxing the digital asset does not mean the source is legalized but my point is that there is nothing wrong in it because if I want to stop this transaction through cryptocurrency, it's a kind of investment. So if I want to stop this thing, don't forget the size of the black market or the underground economy in India. If you want to stop this, the transaction will be there. The only thing that you will lose the revenue. So it is better because you cannot stop the transaction. So it's better to have some revenue from that thing. And on the other issue, you know, introduction of digital currency by RBI, yeah, it's so welcome because most of us use this Amazon Pay, Google Pay, Phone Pay. So what we do, we essentially go for a kind of commitment from the bank that you please pay this money on my behalf. So what is the use of having fiat money or paper currency? So essentially, it's a commitment or promise. So you have this thing and in the uh, long run, maybe uh, we have some benefit of, uh, I mean, benefit kind of thing in, in cost reduction. And for the other thing, you know, I'm not very sure about this digital university. Since I am in the teaching profession, I want to say this thing. Maybe I am a bad rated person, but the thing is that as a teacher, I always want to have eye to eye contact. I want to have interaction, but at the same time, I'm quite sure about it. Probably we are going to go for a hybrid mode of teaching in India. Hybrid, think of Netaji Shubash Open University, so distance learning process. So in distance learning process, what we do, we do not interact online, but essentially, but there is no, I mean, physical interaction. So maybe that will reduce the cost of uh, education a little bit, but to what extent it is going to be useful in creating very good quality of human capital, I am a little doubtful. But overall, at the end, what I want to say is that I am not very happy with the budget. But at the same time, what do you think about this green bond scheme? It's a good, I think, once uh, was a, yeah, was definitely. Sort of financing mechanism. Uh, no, it's, a, it's definitely, I mean, it's not.
unless you push multiplier fine but unless you can ensure some kind of certainty in the job prospects of this large informal sector economy who control something like about 40% of your income and spending not much you can expect because having inequality going up spending propensity for the rich as you know goes towards gold and accumulation of uh, all this uh, valuables it's not productive in that way that's one of the big things the other thing which i have to mention very quickly as uh, vishwajit just said dr mondor it's basically a supply side push and the demand will be taken care of through investment is a double edged sword it helps the supply side as well as it create jobs and demand it's ipc domer said that long time back after the depression economy and this is exactly what is uh, being projected that public capital will create demand down the line as well as it will create the uh, prospect of growth by crowding in private investment good enough let's see how it goes but it's uh, something like continuity nothing dramatic and let's see how it goes over the time uh, well let uh, i think we have to just uh, you know uh, finish the uh, session uh, in fact all the basic points are touched upon there is nothing uh, more new things to be talked about now given the kind of budget which we are having and thank you all thank you mr bondabadai thank you dr mondol and thank you all the participants for uh, giving you, us a patient here thank you very much thank over you sir stay stay safe thank all you okay you. thank you very much yeah yeah over to angana thank you professor dr ajita bhor roy choudhury mr tamal bondabadai and dr bishwajit mondol after the economic perspectives of the on the budget we are moving on to the expert comments on direct and indirect taxes I would request Mr. Aditya Hans, partner Dhruva Advisors LLP, to take the session forward. Aditya, we are running five minutes behind the schedule. We target to end this the next session by 12:20. Over to you, Aditya. Thank you very much, Angana. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you BCCI for giving us this uh, opportunity. Uh, before I embark on this session, and there are two parts to the session: the tax session. The first part is we will discuss the direct tax, indirect tax proposals in Fedbear, and then we will have industry experts from uh, from someone from steel sector, FMCG, all of them giving their views on certain provisions. Uh, before I start the discussion and before I embark on this, I want to also introduce two of my fellow partners, Umesh and Ranjit. Uh, just a minute introduction umesh is a chartered accountant with 30 years of consulting experience in direct tax transaction structuring mm -hmm. and he's got considerable domain expertise in the in advising on tax matters for the pharmaceutical industry whereas ranjit is an advocate as well as a chartered accountant and his area of expertise is in direct taxes gst customs foreign trade policy advocacy and and matters similar to this so they will be joining me for this uh, Aditya, you've gone on mute. Aditya, you you've gone. Yes. Mute. Thank you. One thing we would all concur that the projected economic growth of nine point two percent real GDP terms shows a country's resilience and fighting spirit amidst the global slowdown, which came into being due to multiple waves of COVID virus. In wake of this spirit, the finance minister tabled the union budget for the fiscal year twenty two to twenty three, with the aim of steering the Indian economy over the next twenty five years. well at least in my lifetime i've never heard i've heard a five year plan i've heard of a lot of things but i've never heard of something like 25 years that is from india's 75th year to india's 100th year the budget 22 is a testament of the fact that government is committed to regain the lost momentum of the last two years it's coming up with a lot of measures leading which could lead to a strong economic growth i did hear the economists also and i and i and i completely appreciate the word of caution which they have said Levisia highlighted, but yes, uh, to grow that's that's a natural phenomenon of a human being, and we have to think positively, and that is what we could see in bits and parts and in many places in the budget. It, the budget shows an undeterred and firm resolve of the government to ensure inclusive growth even in the wake of this pandemic, and it is very much in line with the PM's vision of India Atma Bharat 
Atmanirbhar Bharat and India being a digital giant, something which we would not talk about in the last two three years back. This is something probably you can say uh, with the with with the number of unicorns which have got created in the last or or they being recognized or valued in the last one year. Probably this is a, India being a next digital giant is is very much in the talking everywhere in the world. The budget proposes to introduce proposes to introduce digital rupee using blockchain, something which was like a taboo if you would have heard these speeches in the last two years. Blockchain or a cryptocurrency or anything of that was quite a blockchain was not, but a cryptocurrency was something like a taboo. But now they are talking of of legalizing it. Interestingly, the tax on that particular instrument precedes the law, so the law is yet to come in place and the tax is already there. Uh, so because somewhere the government has realized that the Indian population will move into this new uh, form of instrument, new investment instrument. There's no stoppage of that. It's better to regulate it, regularize it, and tax it. There's been significant allocation towards capital expenditure, infrastructure layout, including PM Gati Shakti initiatives set out in which are futuristic and have an inclusive vision for the nation. In the wake of COVID-19 pandemic, there was a strong advocacy for physical prudence, and that is what everyone was saying. But there was again another school of thought: Why physical prudence? Let's let's emulate the Western philosophy and let's go for unbridled physical stimulus. Let's pump in a lot of money. Let's support the uh, public. Let's support the masses give, uh, to support them for the challenges which are facing in the first wave of the pandemic. However, the government adopted a balanced approach. It also adopted opted for fiscal prudence on one hand, but also did not choke too much of the capital expenditure. And today, it is seeing the benefits of that. And again, this is continuing. The today, if you look at for twenty to twenty three, they are looking at seven point five lakhs of. Well, seven point five lakh crores of capital expenditure. We saw this five point five four lakhs of capital expenditure in twenty one twenty two. There is no stopping to it. All of this would create a huge amount of infrastructure spending and a revival of the capital cycle. Now, if I look at it from a direct tax front, so by filing original return is very welcome. Should also take into cognizance there is an additional tax to be paid, but you know this actually helps build a bridge of confidence between the taxpayer and the tax department. I wish it was a little more linear, but that's the way it is. And my fellow partner Umesh will discuss this in Fred Bill. While the crypto bill is still seeing yet to see the light of the day, uh, the 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 taxation element of it has already come in place. Uh, most of the pre-budget expectations, if you see, have come true. We did not see any surprises of like wealth tax, inheritance tax, increase in taxes as against the graded surcharge, which goes on as high as thirty-seven percent. This has resulted in four point five percent reduction in LTCG on unlisted shares, which again is a very welcome. I we were expecting an increase at some places, probably some reduction on the some support on the standard deduction and all of that, but we didn't see an increase. Actually, for the first time, we're seeing a decrease actually. And this is more targeted for the high net worth individuals who are. They want that that you try to if you want you want to monetize your assets which are locked up. You monetize your assets, you will have a four and a half percent lower tax rate. Take that money, infuse it back into the economy. So that's a very welcome move. Uh, now, if you look at it from an indirect tax perspective, this year marked the highest GST revenue collection since inception. Amendments have been proposed in the GST law to further plug tax evasions arising out of non-payment of GST by the supplier. The government is also proposing to amend this SEZ Act, something which we should note. Keeping in mind the Make in India initiative, it is proposed to phase out gradually the concession custom duty rates on capital goods and projected imports, and probably apply a moderate tariff rate, something around seven point five percent. Another interesting proposal, I don't know whether how to look at it. It's the enabling provision of the GST laws where input credit can be restricted, as may be prescribed by the GST, as, as may be prescribed by the government against output credit. Well, we all know that the entire genesis of GST is whether input credit can be set off against output credit. and the government has put in place enabling provisions where they can prescribe how much input credit can be you know somewhere here if you read the fine print and with the more notifications all of that coming we need to understand the intention of the government because somewhere this through the last 3 to 4 years we have achieved some level of sanity around input and output credits there is still uh, challenges around it and the government is slowly and slowly coming up with circulars notifications looking at industry issues and solving the input output credit 
uh, mismatch which happens uh, or the seamless trade flow which doesn't happen at times because at times the output trade may be at a lower tax. So all of that government has been doing. But this provision, there is an element of suspicion which comes in the business's mind. And that is to be seen. And this will be discussed in more detail by my colleague Ranjit Mathani. Now, all in all, the budget proposals highlight the commitment of the government towards tax certainty and reduction in litigation. So you will see there were not surprises, some radical changes. There were more procedural changes, things to ease out, clarificatory in nature, where there was litigation pending at the courts, but no radical change, which would have unsettled, you know, you would have, yes, there is one thing which is really disturbing, and I will be vocal about it, is the foreign dividends. You had actually uh, given an impetus, you had given an incentive that get your money, which is sitting in outside subsidies, get it into India, we'll, probably will have a little lower tax rate, but it was an incentive to get that money. And you had actually thrashed out the concept of IHCs when India Indian companies were going outbound. But now you're actually going to push companies now to again think about IHC structures. That is one proposal where I had a strong reservation and I'll request Sumesh to touch upon that point in more detail. With this, I would want to invite my fellow partner Umesh to discuss the corporate tax proposals and then he can hand it over to Ranjit to discuss the indirect tax proposals. Over to you, Umesh, please. Thank you, Aditya, and uh, good morning to all of you. Uh, it is a pleasure to uh, address uh, Bengal Chamber of Commerce and Industry. Uh, the good thing I like about today's session is that it makes us look east, and I was uh, hearing with a lot of interest the comments of uh, uh, the economists on the panel. Uh, very interesting comments. Uh, without much ado, I will... Is my screen... Uh, visible. Visible now, yes. Is it visible now? So coming coming to the tax proposals on the direct tax side, a few interesting uh, observations initially. I think. Broadly, this marks continuity. The government seems to be focused on uh, ease of compliance, uh, more trust on voluntary compliance. Uh, as far as the tax rates are concerned, no changes on the individual tax rate. As Aditya has already referred, uh, that long-term capital gains, earlier the, concession, the surcharge was capped at 15% for listed securities. Now this surcharge is extended to all classes of uh, long-term capital gains and therefore uh, the earlier surcharge at 25 percent or 37 percent is now all brought down to 15 percent which would result in savings of uh, depending upon the applicable slab uh, a savings of either two percent or 4.6 percent uh, again for companies rates remain unchanged uh, for cooperatives there are a few changes uh, the tax rate has been brought in, the AMT rate has been brought in line uh, with corporates at 15%. Uh, there is also a proposal uh, which is capping the surcharge on consortiums which are participating uh, in, in turnkey projects. Uh, so if, if the consortium is an AOP, then the surcharge on such AOP is capped at 15%. Uh, again, uh, we last two years, we, we battled COVID. India seems to have done well. Uh, there were some proposals introduced by circular of the CBDT. Now some of these pro proposals have been codified uh, under law very quickly. Uh, if an individual uh, has been impacted by COVID and he receives any amount from any person uh, towards his medical expenses, then subject to him actually incurring the uh, expenses in a manner as may be prescribed by the government, uh, the income will not be taxable in his hands. Similarly, there is a relief uh, on account of people who, for people who have succumbed to COVID and therefore if the family members of, of such a person who is deceased on account of uh, any illness arising directly or indirectly on account of COVID, then there are two uh, thresholds that have been provided. If the family receives any money from the employer, then without any monetary limit, uh, the amount will not be considered to be taxable in the hands of the family members. Uh, but if, if the money is received from other persons, sometimes colleagues, 
or or any other relatives or uh, uh, other people who want to support them uh, in, there is a cap of uh, 1 million uh, subject to the money being received by the family members uh, within a period of 12 months from the date of death as far as some of the beneficial provisions uh, in the direct tax proposal uh, the concessional rate for make in india government introduced a very ambitious tax rate of 15% for make in india where uh, ma new manufacturing units had to set up before 31st of march 23 because of covid uh, government did uh, pay heed to some of the recommendations or suggestions that have they received from uh, various uh, chambers and this date has been extended to one more year which means 31st of march 24 the expectation was that because we had two years of COVID, this could have been extended to two years, but uh, government seems to be um, extending only by a year. Similarly, for startups, uh, they have an exemption. Uh, that period is also extended by one year to... Umesh, uh, just once again, I think so your PPT is not uh, running. Uh, you need to run the PPT somewhere. Wait a minute. Thank you. Originally was uh, 31st of March 21. That got extended last year to 31st of March 22. Uh, there was expectation that uh, housing for all, which has been one of the slogans of this government. Uh, but today, the reality is that we are still short of uh, housing for all. And therefore, there was an expectation that even this uh, sunset date would get extended by uh, one or two years more. But that uh, doesn't seem to have materialized. Uh, there. You know, Dinesh, our CEO, did mention about uh, you know voluntary compliance scheme where you know government is collecting a lot of data and uh, basis the various data that the government is collecting. Uh, if there are some misses which the SSC himself realizes, then he has an opportunity to sort of update his return. So what we are now practically going to see is that uh, there are various dates prescribed. One is the regular time limit within which you have to file your regular uh, return. Uh, you avail of that time limit, file your return. If there is a omission or, a, or an error, then you get a time till the end of the assessment year. So therefore, if we are in uh, assessment year 22, 23, then till March uh, 23, you can file a revised return. But if you miss the bus uh, on account of filing of revised return, then you get a further window of two more years. And you can voluntarily uh, update and file an updated return. Uh, of course, uh, you'll have to pay additional tax. The additional tax, uh, they have considered two slabs. So in addition to your regular tax, uh, which includes the tax surcharge and cess, uh, if you file the updated return within a period of 12 months, then the additional tax is 25% of the aggregate tax plus the interest thereon. Uh, and if you file the return within the window of uh, one year to two year, then the additional tax uh, increases to 50%. So if, if the SSC is liable for tax at the rate of say 30%, then in the first bracket within one year, he'll have to pay uh, roughly seven and a half percent additional. And for the second window, he'll have to pay 15% additional. The updated return can also be filed in a scenario where no original return has been filed. Uh, but the government has been uh, very clear that you know this window for filing an updated uh, return is only for people who want to avail the benefit of voluntary compliance. And therefore, there is a long list of uh, people who will not be eligible for uh, availing this uh, updated return filing uh, opportunity. Uh, therefore, if you have been searched or there is a survey or if there is an assessment or a reassessment which is pending uh, if there is some action under pmla or fema then uh, you are not eligible similarly if you want to file a re 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 updated return with a loss that also doesn't seem to be possible if you want to file an updated return by by claiming a refund uh, in terms of what you had originally filed and if you want to claim a refund then that that doesn't seem to be possible and there is a requirement that you know once you file an updated return the assessment will be completed within a period of nine months a uh, lot of things discussed on virtual digital assets i will not 
go into too much detail i think uh, by and large we are clear that there is a separate uh, tax window of uh, tax rate of 30% uh, no deduction or allowance except the original cost uh, also the the loss on account of uh, transfer of a virtual digital asset becomes a separate box and therefore you will not be able to set up that loss against uh, any other uh, income there is now a provision which has been introduced for a for a tds of 1% uh, at the time when you acquire so if if a person is acquiring then he'll have to deduct tds and similarly at the time of sale the person who is making the payment towards the purchase of the virtual uh, digital asset even that person will be required to do a tds of uh, 1% uh, some interesting changes that are that we are seeing and uh, possibly i would want to touch a, a, a thread which is uh, very uh, which is you know common in this budget uh, what we are seeing is that in various matters where the ssc would have taken uh, some some particular stand uh, department has litigated after many years of effort uh, right up to high court or supreme court the ssc has won the decisions in favor uh, government pharma companies and also other corporates there is an existing provision under which uh, if there is any payment towards any purpose which is offense or prohibited under any law then that is not deductible business expenditure uh, some assessees took a stand that uh, you know the offense or a prohibition under law should only extend to a law of the indian state uh, government has now clarified that uh this will also extend to a foreign law uh similarly if there is a compounding of an offense so any any court or any uh, jurisdictional uh, authority has has levied an offense and if you are trying to compound that offense then the compounding fees whether it is in pursuance to an indian law or a foreign law even that will not be treated as a business uh, deductible business expenditure but the provision which is going to impact uh, a law uh, uh, large number of pharma companies is where the payments are made uh, very common that in the pharma industries uh, doctors who are the the ones who prescribe medicines so the pharma companies engage with the doctors in terms of trying to get uh, updated information about uh, patient's health how the medicines are performing uh what are the various diagnostic trends and therefore the pharma companies uh, as part of the engagement process with the doctors sponsor a lot of uh, continuing medical education programs there are uh, holidays uh, some freebies uh, which are granted to doctors medical council of india uh, regulations were amended to say that you know this freebies doctors are prohibited from taking uh, when it came to assessees uh the pharma companies took a stand that what is prohibited is only in the hands of the doctors for us this is these are legitimate business expenditure and therefore uh the same should still be deductible sibility issued a circular that in their view uh, this was not uh, permissible but we had a string of court decisions largely a large number of decisions in favor some against but the government has now clarified that it was always the intention Uh, of the government that you know such uh, payments uh, to professionals if they are prohibited under the code of conduct applicable to such professionals then the payer meaning the pharmaceutical company uh, will also not be entitled to deduction this provision comes with effect from uh, 1422 but the way the provision is is worded uh, there are fears that the tax department will try and sort of pursued the court because the the way that provision is worded it is a clarificatory provision and therefore whether it will have a retrospective effect will be hotly contested uh, between the tax department and the assessees similarly on the health care education cess there was a 1967 circular which said that uh, cess is not tax we all know that tax is not deductible business expenditure but because of this circular assessees took a stand Uh, Rajasthan Bombay High Court uh, gave a favorable view many other tribunals gave a favorable view but the finance ministry uh, believes that this is not in in line with the intention of the government and therefore this is one provision where there is a retrospective effect very clearly 
uh, in the in the budget uh, document and therefore with effect from uh, 1st april 2005 health and education says will not be a deductible expenditure uh, this will create some some spoke for assessees who had uh, taken a stand and who had possibly litigated the matter as aditya referred uh, you know dividend for an overseas investment made by an indian company where the minimum threshold was 26% dividend received from such foreign subsidiary was liable for a concessional rate of tax uh, at 15 percent uh, government seems to believe that they want to bring taxation of foreign dividend uh, on parity with uh, dividend from domestic companies and therefore this concessional rate of 15 percent has been withdrawn uh, doesn't seem to be a well thought out move but uh, this is where we we are and therefore this dividend will now be taxable at the uh, at, at the applicable corporate tax rate uh, to the company which receives the dividend, but they will have the benefit of distributing this foreign dividend to its shareholders. And in case I receive 100 from a foreign uh, associate or a subsidiary, and if I distribute 100 back to my shareholders, then I can avail the deduction under Section 80M, and therefore uh, it will not suffer any tax in the hands of the corporate. Uh, some interesting changes which, which are uh, provided in the budget for uh, uh, you know business reorganization so if there is a merger or a demerger what usually used to happen is that any assessment so if there is an amalgamation the amalgamating company there are some pending uh, assessment proceedings those assessment proceedings would have been initiated in the hands of the amalgamating company uh, there is a parallel process uh, for the merger which with a petition with the NCLT, uh, the petition gets finally uh, sanctioned and the amalgamating company ceases to exist. Now what usually uh, would have happened is that the SSC, assessing officer would have framed the assessment order in the name of the predecessor amalgamating company, which once the order becomes effective, uh, it ceases to exist and therefore we had a a string of decisions right up to Supreme Court, which held that uh, an order passed in the name of a predecessor entity uh, will not be considered to be valid. Uh, government now has has made a prospective amendment to provide that uh, if during the pendency of the proceedings, uh, mark my words, it's only during the pendency of the proceedings, if the tax department frames an assessment order in the name of the predecessor entity then that will consider to be uh, valid there are a few amendments on on ibc basically if if any nclt under an ibc proceedings reduces the tax demand then the tax officer uh, will will now have a power to reduce the tax demand and uh, provide the benefit uh, I think not much to say curbing tax avoidance, they have, exp they have expanded the uh, eligible category of uh, uh, securities to equity shares, uh, REIT, INVIT, AIF. A very interesting, important amendment is with regard to cash credits. And uh, uh, so if I receive a loan from, from Mr. X, I not only have to uh, provide the credit worthiness of, of that person but also the source of that person and if i do if i'm not able to discharge the uh, the owners then the assessing officer can tax me uh, also if there is any uh, undisclosed uh, income which is taxed then i can take the benefit of a loss uh, reduction and a loss set off against that undisclosed income i think reassessment provisions very quickly uh, in couple of minutes uh, uh, Last year, the entire reassessment window was recast. Uh, now, reassessment is based on information. They have widened the category of information to cover uh, audit objection, any information uh, exchange under tax treaty, uh, any, any information collected by the government under a scheme for faceless connection. Uh, there are other changes, but I think I will skip those other changes. Uh, again, for withholding tax uh, for international payments, they have provided a concessional uh, a new regime uh, whereby uh, instead of preferring an appeal before the CIT appeal, you can file an application uh, to the AO and the AO will have to pass a speaking order 
uh, within six months time and if the order is not in line with the SSC's expectation then he can appeal. Interesting uh, provision that they have introduced uh, where you know if there is a recurring issue of law which is which is either of the SSC or any other uh, SSC then the tax department usually used to pursue uh, appeals in all such cases. Now there is a window created that uh, subject to decision of uh, some senior authorities, they can make an application to the tribunal or high court that if there is a, a similar matter issue of law which is pending, then uh, no appeal to be filed till, till the matter gets decided by the Supreme Court or the high court. Uh, a change in 14A, uh, again, trying to undo the Supreme Court uh, uh, jurisdictional position that, you know, if you have not received any exempt income, then no disallowance under uh, 14A can take place. Now, government seems to have clarified that uh, even if you have not received any exempt income, then uh, you will be, you the disallowance under 14A can still apply. On the debenture, a similar amendment to undo another Supreme Court uh, decision. I think there are some other provision, uh, uh, procedural changes that have been made. I will uh, skip in the interest of time. But if there are any questions around those, then we can cover. Uh, Aditya, how, how, how much time do I have? Uh, three, four minutes you have. Okay. We okay. Go to five more minutes also, and then Ranjit will take Okay. Okay. Yeah. So last year the government uh, introduced a, a higher TDS rate for uh, people who are not filing uh, return of income. So if you are making a payment to any any supplier or a contractor, and if the contractor is not filing uh, his return, uh, the period that was subject to monitoring was two year period. Now that period has been reduced to one year period. Uh, TDS, we've already discussed that, you know, there is a uh, TDS of 1%. Uh, there is also a TDS of 10%, which is now uh, introduced in respect of any payment, which is in the nature of a benefit or a perquisite, which is arising from business or profession. And this will be applicable, especially to uh, agents who are, who are taken uh, for foreign tools or doctors where any benefit or perquisite which is taxable in their hands. Uh, uh, they, so the pharma company or the corporate which is making the payment will be required to deduct uh, TDS. Uh, there is a typo, it's not 1%, it's 10%. On IFSC, I think what we are seeing over the last few years is that by in bits and pieces, the government is trying to uh, somehow make the uh, international uh, IFSC gift city workable. And therefore, we have Uh, uh, which are listed in this slide. Uh, again, uh, you know, IFSC has seen some traction in the last year, uh, but but it, it's all happening in, in trickles and therefore uh, one only waits that uh, whatever is, is the final policy, if the government can think through the entire act and come with a uh, robust policy, then that will encourage uh, more uh, companies to set up in the IFSC some some uh, amendments for charitable trust uh, they have tightened uh, the scope for cancellation of registration especially in a situation where any benefit is passed on to uh, the trustees or relatives of the trustees um, 1023 uh, c hospitals or educational institutions which were governed by a separate code of uh, provisions now you know some of the provisions which are applicable to charitable uh, institutions uh, will now also be equally applicable to such 1023C uh, institutions. Um, thank you, friends, for uh, the opportunity to share my thoughts on the direct tax proposals. Uh, over to you, Ranjit. And if there are any questions, we'll take up the questions uh, uh, as convenient. Thank you, Umesh. Okay, so uh, with, with with the direct tax uh, proposals and amendments uh, having been discussed, 
um, we we can now pick up the ones on indirect taxes. Uh, the interesting part about uh, the proposals in the indirect tax space is that um, not much was expected in respect of the uh, GST law. Uh, that's because the GST council is supposed to sort of, you know, have a sitting and thereafter when the decisions are made, they are implemented. And so uh, while there was a significant wish list as regards GST, there wasn't uh, an expectation, I think, uh, across the professional and the industry bodies uh, both. Uh, however, we've seen quite a bit of uh, amendments that have been brought in uh, in respect of the GST law as well. Uh, uh, of course, customs is also some part of uh, changes are there in the customs law as well. So we'll discuss those now in the next few slides. And uh, Pratik, if you could bring up the first slide, please. Right. So this is perhaps the more significant one of the provisions. Uh, effectively, uh, till date, the uh, credit was taken uh, in the law. It was provided in a provisional manner. That was how the provision was. Uh, that has been amended. So now you are taking the credit based on a final self-assessment basis. That's an amendment which is there covered in one of the subsequent slides. Uh, but effectively, uh, with the amendment that was very 2022 whereby the uh, data in terms of the credit is communicated to you uh, by virtue of the return filed by the supplier now it is further sort of uh, augmented the provision in section 16 which is the credit enabling provision is further augmented to specify that the credit will be available to you based on the communication that is there from the uh, supplier and uh, it is be available provided it is not restricted by virtue of what is now the annexure to be. So if the portal in the manner in which it populates the information for your credit uh, will put out the data in two baskets, effectively credit which is available and effectively credit which is not available, uh, then you would not be able to take the credit which is in the not available basket. And that's the effect and purport of the amendments which are made in both section 38 and section 16. Section 16, if I remind you, is the provision which enables you to take credit. So what does section 38 uh, now as re substituted and reintroduced uh, state? So you will have a annexure to be which will be populated and given to you as a taxpayer who wants to take credit. Uh, this will have uh, information in two parts, details of inward supplies in respect of which ITC may be available. And then there is inward supplies in respect of which you cannot take credit. Now, mind you, this is above and beyond what is the restrictions placed in section 17, which concerns credits which are unavailable. So what do we have here in this list is where a recently registered uh, taxpayer is trying to pass on credit. They have brought in a provision to have that restricted. Um, perhaps uh, to avoid uh, you know, uh, fly-by-night operators uh, making merry out of the situation. Uh, another of the situations where they have uh, looked to deny credit is a person, a taxpayer, who has defaulted in payment of tax for a prescribed period. Now, this effectively means that if a supplier has not paid tax, uh, how would you know <clears throat> that is something that has been debated for long now? Here is a sort of mechanism by which you will know that he has not paid tax because it does not populate in your annexure to be. Uh, another of those uh, restrictions that is brought in is there the reported amount by the supplier in the GSTR1, which is his outward supply, is in excess of that which is the actual tax paid. So if in the 3B he has reported a amount lesser than that which was reported in GSTR1, in which case <clears throat> the government is being denied of the amount of tax which it ought to have received, there will be a consequential effect on you, the receiver, and you will be denied the credit. Another of those uh, situations is where the supplier to you has availed excess credit. And if he has availed excess credit, you will be denied the uh, credit of the amount of tax charged by him in his invoice to you. Uh, please uh, you know, be mindful of the sort of uh, uh, extent to which this provision is going in. It's saying that the supplier will uh, not be able to pass on credit to you if he has availed excess credit. And therefore, uh, the credit and the health situation of the supplier becomes important and very vital uh, to understand 
so that you are not sitting out of pocket on this amount of tax uh, amounts. Uh, another uh, situation where there has been denial of credit is where the discharge of tax liability is not in accordance with the provisions of section 4912, which has been introduced now, which effectively requires that payment be made in cash. So if there is a payment being made only through credit, then there is an ability for your credit to get blocked, uh, even though the supplier is <coughs> making payment and has not actually uh, avoided the payment of tax to the government. And then there may be a separate class of people for whom it may be prescribed. So uh, going forward, uh, Prati, can you take up the next slide? Yeah. So there are some issues which come up, and I think uh, in in the interest of time, I would just you know maybe mention them rather than discuss them at at length. But there seems to be a large requirement in the system in the portal, so that uh, if there is a reason why credit is denied, and there is a subsequent rectification or a curing by the supplier then there should be a mechanism by which the receiver uh, can subsequently take credit. So that is something that we will have to wait and watch and await in that uh, system and portal to enable the credit to be taken, even if denied at the initial phase. Uh, there are, you know, obviously also going to be other questions that will arise is that uh, can the restriction be, uh, you know, tested out in the court of law wherein uh, I as a receiver, I am being denied, I am being punished for a default which my supplier makes. So he takes in incorrect credit, he doesn't make a payment in cash as is required by one of the provisions and the consequence of that is my credit is therefore getting affected. Now, uh, is that a fair system? Is that a GST that was designed by the government in the initial uh, phases? Or is that now a improvisation which is only going to make it far more onerous and harsh from a taxpayer's point of view? These are things which will come up and, and you know, we will have to wait and watch as, as courts take them up. Similarly, as courts take these up, there will be a question as whether the uh, ITC uh, should be denied to me without first having had recourse to the uh, supplier. So if there is a problem at the end of the supplier, why is the credit being denied to me without first having knocked on his door is a question which will have to be addressed. And it has been uh, observed by certain decisions that that is the approach that should be made, that the uh, tax department goes to the supplier first. So as I, as I mentioned, this is perhaps the more significant of the amendments that are there in the GST uh, scheme. And uh, this will be quite a uh, space to wait, uh, to watch out for, because the developments will really have an impact on business on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, Prateek, can you take the next slide? Uh, so uh, there is, of course, the uh, connected amendment in section 16 to BA, which is an insertion now, and which effectively says that you will take credit only if it is uh, communicated in the manner in which it is given, and it is not restricted in the manner that was just discussed in the prior slide. Uh, another of the amendments concerns the ability to take credit. This is welcome because we were previously sitting with the return of September, which was ordinarily filed by the 20th of October. Now there is a further period available and that's running up to 30th of November of the subsequent financial year. So from the March end, you have now up to 30th of November to take up any credits that you may have missed out or that you may have overlooked for some reason or the other. Similarly, the time limit for issuing a credit note has also been uh, extended up into 30th of November of the following financial year. Um, one of the provisions that was there in section 37 was uh, the outward supply uh, returns and its communication to the recipient will be subjected to such uh, conditions and restrictions as may be prescribed. Now, the, all of these are being amendments made so that the credit flow is checked and it's you know enabled in a way that the department and the government is able to make sure that they get the uh, revenue and tax that is uh, actually uh, due from the supplier. Uh, we are aware that the uh, provisions of GST at the inception were in prepared in such a way that there would have been a matching and only upon matching uh, of the amount of tax paid by a supplier that the return uh, reflected it and then the uh, receiver would be able to take the credit. And this was the scheme of provisions in section 42, 43 and a set of other rules. 
Now, uh, we are also aware that these changes actually, uh, these, sorry, these provisions actually never got effected, uh, effectuated. They were not notified as such. Uh, we did not even have a GSTR 2. We did not have a GSTR 3. Instead, we have an abridged return of sorts in GSTR 3B. And now we have the provisions altogether being omitted and uh, you know a separate scheme being introduced in a way of speaking where the credit is allowed to you as per that which is communicated to you and it is not restricted and you take it on a self-assessment basis. And if there is an excess credit taken or by whatever reason there is an improper credit taken, if you have not utilized it, then you are uh, all right. Otherwise, you will also have to pay interest and you will also have to reverse it is, is the you know, sort of natural consequence one has to be aware of. Uh, Prati? Right. So uh, the, the substantive provision has also been introduced uh, so that if you've not filed your GSTR uh, one for the previous period, uh, you cannot file it for the subsequent period. And I think this is, uh, again, one of those provisions which is uh, meant to address situations of the defaulters and the sort of the compliant people may not have to worry about it. Nevertheless, they have to be aware about it. Um, the, the provision in section 41, of course, has been uh, amended to the effect that it is on self-assessment basis, credit is on self-assessment basis. And connected to that is the provision in section 50, which deals with interest, which clarifies that input tax credit should have been wrongly availed and utilized, as was the position in the pre-GST regime, that then only would interest be applicable. Uh, Pratik, can I take the next slide? The uh, provision uh, has been introduced to enable a transfer of balance in an electronic credit ledger, sorry, in an electronic cash ledger. Uh, and in fact, I would clarify that there is no provision for transfer uh, of, of a balance in an electronic credit ledger. Uh, the, the provision now introduced or proposed is that there will be transfer of balance in the cash ledger on account of tax, interest, penalty, or fee. A, it could go to the IGST, CGST, SGST in the same registration. Uh, or it could go to another state only when it concerns IGST and CGST, where it's the same PAN <clears throat> and it's a distinct person effectively registered in the other state. This is, comes with a sort of rider that there is no output tax liability that is unpaid in the registration which seeks to make a transfer. Uh, uh, enabling provision again introduced in GST laws so that it limits uh, the amount of credit that you use and uh, therefore need to pay tax in cash. Uh, you would recall, uh, friends, that in Rule 86B, we had a restriction being introduced uh, in the budget last year. And effectively, where the tax liability exceeded 50 lakhs, there was a necessity to pay tax at least 1% in cash. Now, where a enabling provision has been brought in, this provision uh, has been given the necessary teeth in my view. And therefore, we may see this being effectuated uh, very soon, whereby uh, at least a portion of our tax would have to be paid in cash. Therefore, the government would maintain and swell its kitty because it would collect the cash by virtue of this provision. Uh, Pati? Yeah, certain uh, provision dealing with refund for an ACZ developer or unit, there was a confusion in, in, the, in the field formation and different provisions or time of grant of refund. Now that is sought to be addressed and the relevant date will be the date of filing of the GSTR 3B in respect of which the supplies arose. Certain clarifications with uh, respect to alcoholic liquor licenses and uh, the clarification is to the effect that uh, there was no tax liability for a given period, but if any tax was collected, it would be uh, not be refunded to the party if at all such tax was collected. Uh, Pratik, can you go ahead? Yeah, Section 53, uh, as I mentioned, is an important one uh, because the provision as on date as it stood until this amendment is effectuated is that there was a matching requirement and only in those situations where there was an ITC mismatch as per the provisions which were there in section 42, would the credit uh, become liable to be paid and interest would have been applicable. However, uh, with the amendment that is now pro uh, proposed, it has been simplified. The rate has been brought down from 24 to 18%. That's the first one. The second aspect is that there has to be ITC, which has been wrongly availed and utilized. 
and therefore a simplification has been made in the provision and this has been given effect with retrospective uh, date from 1st of July 2017. Uh, I'll, I'll take up the customs uh, amendments now um, and I think uh, there, there aren't far too many but, but some of them are quite significant in keeping with the uh, uh, sort of observation which uh, Umesh also made that there is unfortunately quite a few uh, situations where retrospective amendments are being made. And uh, here is one more where the government has now, uh, you know, sort of proposed and effectively to overcome a decision of the Supreme Court in March 2021 uh, for uh, the purposes of what are the powers and jurisdiction uh, and the abilities of a officer of the uh, Directorate of Revenue Intelligence or the audit and preventive formation of the customs. So they are now all going to be considered as officers of customs. Second, there can be a power uh, exercised by the board to uh, provide them or to allow or allocate to them the assignment and their functions. Uh, and there could be different bases which, which they can have. Uh, it could be geographical, it could be monetary, it could be sector and, and so on and so forth. And these amendments uh, are proposed in the provisions so that there is no further doubt that these are all officers of customs, that they have the necessary powers and that they can execute and they can undertake all the functions that have been allocated to them. Connected to this is a sort of validation clause which has been introduced and uh, that is seeks to, uh, you know, sort of validate all actions taken, done by these officers, which are the uh, officers of the DRI, the audit and preventive, as also others and uh, sort of uh, effectively negate or I would say overcome the observations that were there in Canon India's case in March of last year. Now, uh, it will be interesting because uh, various high courts have taken view on the basis of the Supreme Court's ruling and have given relief to the uh, importer taxpayers. And now the situation will arise that there are several petitions still pending in different high courts how will they view it uh, is, is a question. Second is there is a review petition as regards Canon. So will the government now also showcase this retrospective amendment and effectively uh, have Canon India's uh, decision overturned even by the Supreme Court? Uh, these are things that we will have to sort of wait and watch. Uh, in my view, there is one aspect of Canon India's uh, ratio, which may still continue to hold. And I think the, the jury is still out on that. And that observation is that the same officer which made the assessment should make the reassessment. And <clears throat> while there is a provision or a clause in uh, uh, clause 93 in proposed in the finance bill to address that problem with a prospective effect, it does not seem to address that problem with a retrospective effect. And that's something I think courts will have to sort of weigh in and on and, and we'll have to wait and watch. Uh, section 14 is is sort of be amended to make a uh, you know sort of provision so that there is a rule making power is given to the board in respect of certain undervaluation which which occurs in situations that they have detected so there's an onus now that will be placed on the importer to uh, take care of uh, all those processes and steps so that there is no undervaluation situation uh, I think. Uh, advanced ruling, I think, is um, uh, uh, just one thing. Uh, we can we uh, we we'll have to move into the next one in the next four five minutes. Yeah, we'll be done, uh, Aditya. We'll be done in Thank four five. Minutes. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, the changes in advanced ruling aren't uh, significant except for the one which allows you to now withdraw it at any point in time as long as the ruling has not been given. And uh, sorry, I would I would uh, correct myself. There is a, another aspect of this provision which is amended, which is that there is a lifespan now which is given for this particular advance ruling. So it is three years or till there is a change in law or facts on the basis of which the ruling was pronounced. Uh, it's not quite clear why they needed to do this because if an advance ruling is sought and implemented, and you know sort of uh, business is operating on the basis of that advance ruling. Uh, midstream would they be expected to you know sort of go and reapproach the government or sorry the, the advance ruling body and have a rollover of that particular advance ruling uh, uh, is that what is expected like it was being done in the context of the special valuation branch or the SVB orders that's something we'll have to sort of you know uh, have some clarity on because uh, otherwise uh, this this would become an unworkable proposition 
um, I think we can uh, also note that there has been uh, um, situations where sensitive data, sensitive information, import and export related, uh, you know, data and records have been sort of published or put into the public domain without uh, authorization or while even if it was privileged and confidential, it was, you know, sort of put out into the public domain. Uh, the provision now provides for a fine and, in, uh, a, you know, imprisonment in case of violation of uh, the provisions, uh, which is publishing of the information relating to the import and export uh, data, which has been submitted to the customs. Yeah, take the next one. Yeah, take the next one, Pratik. The SEZ law is uh, proposed to be amended, updated, and, um, and upgraded effectively where states will become partners and there will be, I think, a greater integration with the uh, customs law as well so that uh, there is ease of doing business and, uh, you know, we truly achieve the uh, competitiveness for our export uh, uh, supplies. Um, I think that's uh, next one. Yeah. Uh, this came in actually, uh, you know, late last night, this morning, a uh, very uh, important sort of uh, clarification has been issued. It's a clarification. It's not part of the budget document. It's a clarification by virtue of a circular issued by the board, which effectively says that where customs duty is nil and computed as zero, then there will not be a social welfare surcharge, which will be liable to be paid, even though the notification for granting of exemption of SWS is not given. So the clarification effectively says that the SWS will be zero, provided the customs duty is zero, and you would not have to find a specific exemption for SWS. There was a decision of the Supreme Court in Unicorn Industries last year, and this particular uh, sort of clarification would uh, you know, clarify, uh, assist in making uh, that situation, that complex uh, situation where there were uh, SWS demands on, on, on importers uh, sort of now being negated. Uh, that, yeah, Pratik. Uh, so from a overall make in India, Atma Nirbhar Bharat, uh, there has been, you know, a lot of uh, push and, 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 and focus on the PLI schemes. And we are seeing that in respect of even uh, some solar sector and in respect of the 5G sector, and there's allocation now for all of that. Um, to promote the domestic manufacturing, as I mentioned, Make in India and Atmanirbhar Bharat, certain custom duty rates have been increased on certain products. In respect of certain other uh, uh, you know, sectors, capital goods rates have been uh, reduced. And in certain uh, cases, the import uh, duty rates, the tariff rates for the final goods have been increased essentially to you know give a boost to the domestic manufacturing sector and and uh, make the uh, uh, you know the concept of atmanirbhar bharat more effectively implemented uh, i think you can take the next one yeah so these are the uh, you know summary of all of the key proposals that were there on the indirect access front and the custom side um, uh, over to you thank you. thank you ranjit thank you very much uh, we will attend to the questions of but you know, we have a very interesting session now where we have uh, four stalwarts who have been associated with tax in their respective companies. And I will introduce them and, uh, and we will pose some questions to them. And obviously, uh, we'll also try to get your and Umesh's perspective on those questions. And we'll also attend to questions from the audience. Uh, I would like to invite uh, the senior most person from the distinguished panelists, uh, Mr. Praveen Soon. Uh, well, he's three decades of experience. He's the chief tax, chief corporate and international tax head of Tata Steel, uh, with three decades of experience and handled different portfolios. Uh, hello, Mr. Soon. Hi. Hi, Aditya. Uh, I would next want to invite uh, Mr. Pradeep Mitra. He's the deputy general manager of finance tax at Tata Sons. Uh, and uh, well, I know him personally, he's four generations of Tata. I think so he's a fourth generation working with the Tatas and he's worked across different Tata companies like Tata Sons, Tata Motors, Tata Teleservices. Uh, next, I would want to introduce- Thank you, uh, Aditya. Thank you, and Thank you to the entire forum. Thank you. Uh, so Rahul Verma, he's head of tax at CIPLA. He's more than 20 years of experience with experience in direct tax, indirect taxes, transfer pricing, 
and worked in so many diverse companies like which are IT, tires, manufacturing, pharmaceutical, loads of experience bringing on the table. Hello, Mr. Verma. Uh, Mr. Verma, you are on mute. Yeah, thank, thanks, Aditya. Thanks for giving me the opportunity. Thank you very much. And uh, we also have Naresh Somani. He is the head taxation at Marico. Well, one of the most, uh, you know, uh, an Indian M FMCG whom we call pure and uh, an out and out Indian FMCG whom we take pride about. Uh, Naresh himself has got more than 15 years of experience. He's worked in Marico. He's working in Marico. He's worked in ITC. He's worked in Hindustan Zing. Uh, welcome. I welcome Naresh. Thanks, thanks, Adan Aditya, for having me here. So the way we'll run this uh, panel discussion is I will put up a question and I will uh, then seek your views and I will invite each of you to give your views on this. Uh, well, I will start with the first question, which is on the updated tax returns. You know, something something which is unthought of, not thought of. And if you if you associate something in the, this budget uh, on the tax proposals with the word out of the box, I would call this amendment as out of the box, something which we could not have think, thought of also. And rather, if you look at the wish list of any of the consultants and anyone, this was not there in the list for sure. Now, as Umesh has already discussed this provision in detail, I'll just, in a two lines, I'll just summarize the provision. It permits the taxpayers to file updated return on payment of additional tax and can be filed within two years. Obviously, with a different implication when you do it in one year from the end of the assessment and different implication when you do it in two years from the end of the assessment year. It's come as a good surprise to all of us. And I say good surprise. It's a surprise, but it's a good surprise. It clearly reflects the intention of the government to bridge a trust deficit, which is there, and build a trust-based relationship with the taxpayers. Now, I would invite Mr. Sood first to seek his views. That Do you share the same views? And how do you look at this provision, which is there? Mr. Sood, over to you, please. Yeah. I think it's a very welcome move. Uh, first, because it's a step forward, uh, because the stated intention of the government is to reduce protracted litigation. But I have not seen many in the organized sector, people not filing their returns. Um, it might be a very, very rarity. But it's the unorganized sector where you can find uh, slip-ups taking place, especially because uh, there was this notion that they can possibly escape the tax net. But now with the automation and digitalization of the tax records, with AIS coming, Form 26AS coming, it will be increasingly difficult for the unorganized corporate assessees also to not file tax returns. And I think this will widen the tax handbook. It's a very welcome move because the consequences of penal provisions can then be, you know, uh, will not depend. And it's a sort of a unlimited avatar of uh, amnesty scheme mm -hmm. um, in a way, uh, if you can see. So people will on their own try to come and possibly file returns, especially I, I believe non-resident assessees um, because they stick to their positions. And if supposing there is a tribunal or a high court ruling coming where which is going adverse to their uh, stand taken, then they are in a position to possibly file returns and escape further scrutiny and penal consequences. I think it's a very, very welcome step. The only thing is, I was just seeing it, um, even if you file an updated return, you can still be picked up for reassessment. That is one thing. Second thing is that you are not allowed carry forward of losses. And I think if you are bringing parity um, as if you are filing a return for the first time, um, that could have been allowed here. Uh, not a setting off of losses, you know, because in many South Asian, East Asian countries, this sort of a provision of setting off losses is allowed. I think that would have been a, a welcome step. But otherwise, in holistically speaking, I think it's a it's a definitely a welcome move. Um, and um, I believe it will definitely be uh, widening the tax net. Thank you, Mr. Sudan. And I think so your suggestion uh, of improving upon this because it's still a, it's still a, a proposal. It's not in the act. So this is something we will uh, we will work with the Chamber of Commerce also. If you can make a representation that if these uh, they, this could be this provision could be a little more attractive as well, Mr. Varma, uh, what is your take on this? Yeah, it's a uh, you know welcome move by the government in terms of you know reducing the litigation. 
so this is uh, what i think the best thing i like about this government is they you know they want to make the whole uh, system non adversarial they don't want cases to go to, go to the court and kind of you know settle uh, between the tax payer and the tax department amicably and this is a uh, you know kind of a additional uh, tool that they had given that uh, you know come forward to update your returns and uh, resolve the matter up front but having said that yeah for uh, you know corporate like uh, us uh, you know even looking at you know paying some 25% or 50% additional tax uh, is out of question like you know first of all you know you are we are in india at a very high tax rate on top of it you are looking at someone to pay 25 or 50% additional tax this is out of question so i think when the government is looking at uh, you know resolving this uh, dispute you know it has to be lenient as well you know how can you expect uh, you know someone to just correct some mistake which has got a different interpretational issues or maybe as uh, mr parvin so said it could it is depending on the outcome of some case in the tribunal or high court or supreme court you can't expect the tax pay to pay additional uh, you know 25 or 50% so i think this is something you know if they want to make it go in the right direction of you know reducing litigation then it has to be you know win win for both wherein the department don't uh, you know spend in time of paying to the lawyers at the same time uh, uh, you know the corporate world also have live their life uh, you know peacefully so which i believe i think should be kind of put across to the government that the 25% or 50% additional tax is very high uh, tax outflow for uh, you know for corporate like us for correcting mistakes based on judicial interpretations thanks pradeep you want to add something to this or you share the same views thank you aditya no i completely agree with my senior and dear colleague mr sood and this is really a very welcome and it has you know it's achieving three objectives not only voluntary compliance reducing litigation but also as a measure of uh, revenue mobilization for the government one point i would like to additional point i would like to uh, put on the table is that for the new tax payers or for that unorganized sector which we are we are talking about the adoption of technology uh you know that sense of being reconciled and all this adoption of all these new tools which has come ais 26as mm-hmm. so many yeah. new tds provisions which are coming and uh, as somewhere we were reading that nudge approach so all this is going to give a tool to the government to mm-hmm. uh, to widen the tax base and have a, they have a target specific ssc's whom they will be pursuing it and the large investment which is going on the big data on the on the technology platform uh as a tax payer we have to inculcate a higher adoption of this technology basis so that we we stay po- we reconciled and you know and we have an window we have come across such practical scenarios whereby this class of ssc's they want to pay tax but they have no window to pay tax they have to wait till the time the assessing officer will pick them up and they will get into that long drawn process which they don't want but so today an avenue has come for this target ssc's that they can uh, you know non resident etc when they are aware of it they can go and uh, buy piece and uh, be ha- be a, be a, uh, be proud tax payer mm. thank you pradeep you know naresh just to sum up what mr sood mr varma and pradeep all of them are saying is that this is generally not so much for the large corporate it may be one of those errors which may happen but it's generally for a different class of ssc's who have probably evaded income or and now they want to come back come into net and there is a window so do you also agree with that view or is it in a little yeah, certainly uh, certainly aditya probably uh, what mr uh, sood said uh, was uh, bang on in terms of that uh, it is more to do with an organized sector than the organized uh, organized players and i think it is uh, somewhere down the line it is more to do with uh, the huge amount of uh, data churning which uh, nowadays department has been doing so they uh, they also get a quite a uh, long time of window in terms of uh, churning the data coming out with uh, their own uh, analysis and then uh, uh, look out for these uh, uh, for these tax payers who are uh, kind of uh, indulging into evasion activities Okay, great. Umesh, uh, you heard everyone that the industry from different steel and and uh, pharma and FMCG. What is your take on it? Is there a room for improvement in this provision, or we should just digest, bite the bullet the way it is? Yeah, I think I think as has been echoed by a lot of my colleagues on this panel that <clears throat> this is largely for 
uh, non corporates uh, individual ssc is uh, where where the possibility of some misses happening are are higher uh, when it comes to corporates most of the corporates would have uh, taken very articulated positions and mm. barring the situation which narish pointed out that you know there is a genuine slip or a miss uh, only then somebody would want to avail this opportunity and as a corporate if you've taken a stand on a particular issue and there are some adverse uh, high court or uh, supreme court decisions uh, since you are already protected by a penalty uh, it may still not make sense uh, for you to avail of this uh, window mm. under an uh, updated return because if you are protected uh, on the penalty side on a legal issue then you can you can still pay pay the tax together with the interest in this case in addition to the tax and interest you are you are required to pay uh, 25% and uh in the second bracket 50% which uh, as rahul said you know no no corporate would want to uh, buy it unless unless it is you know a very hard push so we just straight question so something like an education says now that uh, there it's a part of the act now and it's clear now what would you look at corporates you know uh, this provision getting triggered from 1st april would they be moving into this and taking the advantage of the revising the returns paying the taxes or or how would they this take the alternative route no ah uh, sorry yeah yeah mr so yeah you can you want to no i i so so that's a gray area i think we will contest because like supposing in our case itself i have a favorable tribunal decision my education says has been upheld uh and this is a clarification the way they have put it i will contest this case till the very end you know and because they are still not clear they are making a retrospective amendment and they are not talking about interest and penal provisions they could have easily put it in the law that in such cases of retrospective amendment interest and penal provisions will not uh, uh, apply uh, on one hand they are actually uh, talking about that the department is not going to file an appeal if the matter is lying at high court and supreme court and they are awaiting judgments there on the other hand they are tinkering with the tribunal decisions which have come back and not giving the safeguard of interest and penal provisions to be mm. you know not to be paid by the ssc so they, there is a sort of a um, you know uh, an evil intent of generating revenue you know i i'm sorry to say that because they are on the right path but behind there is a lurking suspicion that they sh- they should mop up revenues wherever possible to the largest extent possible and that is something which is not right and having you know when you are talking about this updated return i think rahul and naresh uh, you need to sum it up by saying that the government will save on using their administrative machinery and hence by they they the cost will be saved because it's not easy for the administrative machinery to go after the ssc in, in in a large country like india so it has its own pitfalls now on one hand they have this huge um, you know 25 to 50% additional to be paid uh on the other hand they are going to save on cost so a bit of leniency in terms of uh, you know cost to be paid in case of genuine slip ups or they can come up with a clarificatory circular what is that what is making them uh, revise the return is it a genuine slip or is it something else so that would also help uh, possibly the corporates you know thank you thank you mr sud for being candid uh, with your points uh with this i would like to move to the next question uh, which is extension of the sunset clause for new manufacturing well the amendment is very simple 2023 was the the date now it's been taken to 2024 march april march 24 but you know this is again from a industry perspective uh, and again it will be a steel specific sector pharma specific and an fncg specific uh and in my later part of my this our discussion i will show you that there is a strange kind of optimism in the market about growth well we are talking about 9.2% gdp growth we are talking about 9% growth again and not only india but imf has confirmed and then again a 8% 7% in the ensuing years with that kind of a growth when this amendment came or when this came in the ordinance in way back in 2019 that time you had a three and a half years window you thought of a particular production plan but with this new wave of uh, buoyancy are your company because for steel it will be difficult because when you plan you any setup with any manufacturing which you set up in a new company it will take 3 to 4 years to set up 
Houseover, the three and a half years window would, was houseover small for steel. But for FMCG and for pharma, setting up a manufacturing facility is a reality in two years. So uh, if you had decided, say, you would do X amount of new production in a new company to take advantage of the 115 BAB, this new provision, do you think that your management would now actually go back to the table and say, why not look at another round of expansion? Because the intent of the government is that I know you will not be able to meet the timeline. But would you want to make, would your sector, pharma or uh, FMCG look at further expansion than what was thought of? I know the provision, the way it stands today is that if you set up production before 2013, that company will enjoy the benefit for lifelong. But I have my doubts. Government will definitely come up with an amendment at some point of time that all the facilities which have been set up by 2013 will only enjoy. In the same company, what has been set up after 2013 would not. Although that's not the way the law stands today. But we all know the government, the way the government has been bringing about amendments, they will bring this also in 13, 2023 or 2024 or 2025. So my question to uh, Rahul and Naresh, uh, uh, first I will ask Rahul. Yeah, so I think this is a very welcome move and it has come without paying any additional tax or additional fee. So all the more welcome. And, uh, you know, besides that, uh, you know, uh, and this is something which has been, uh, you know, one of the major asked by the Pharma Association. Like most of our pharma players, like, uh, you know, have invested into new, uh, you know, green fields, uh, so to say. But, uh, you know, getting a green field up and running may not be possible in the initial window, which is given by the government. Considering you read, uh, you know, Indian FDA approval, foreign FDA approval, a lot of calibration of the processes, uh, you know, to produce uh, medicine in the perspective that the US FDA or the Indian FDA wants. So uh, this is a big ask by the pharma association. And, uh, you know, we thank the government to, uh, you know, making the extension. And we shall be, you know, leveraging that considering we need to just kind of optimize our production processes to make sure that, uh, you know, we come up with our production and manufacturing facilities within the uh, given timeline. So this is what I feel so. And, uh, you know, uh, most of the companies have already been set up with that uh, initial uh, time window, which is given uh, in the law. And I I'm not sure that, uh, you know, somebody is going to, you know, look at, uh, you know, sitting on the drawing board again. With that one-year extension, because this, uh, you know, my, any manufacturing facility uh, will take lots of time as, as far as pharma is concerned. Thanks, Aditya. Now, standing today, we still have two years, two months. Although it's a one-year. No, that's extension. true, but uh, I don't think so. Any, uh, uh, you know, pharma facility which require approval from FDA, and if you are looking at exports, you are, uh, you know, approval from the WHO and other uh, bodies as well. So I don't think it's going to be uh, possible uh, in a small. Uh, window unless you are you know making some low end products and all uh, which may not be the right thing for the top end uh, pharma companies in india okay but naresh i think so fmcg is a different uh, different game you know yeah, I mean, probably, probably I would, uh, I would say purely from FMCG perspective, you know, uh, it is not uh, like other uh, capital intensive industry where you take a lot of time in terms of setting up the manufacturing facility. However, having said that, uh, uh, considering uh, we, we have seen that uh, over these uh, three years that there has been a, a dynamic change in the consumption pattern at the consumer uh, end and uh, industry like us have been on their toes in terms of uh, uh, coming out with uh, new innovative uh, products uh, for the market. Mm -hmm. And uh, purely from that perspective, looking at the uh, promising products which uh, each of the FMCG players might be uh, looking into, this this is a very welcome move in terms of extending uh, this particular uh, sunset clause by one year so that uh, companies can always think of uh, setting up that uh, green field uh, in spite of the fact that it is it means it, it does not take uh, that much time mm -hmm. as in case of other industries to set that uh, manufacturing facility. Yes, Mr. Sudh, I think so. This is a question which will not be so relevant for the steel sector because I don't think so. Even anyone can get back to the drawing board and set up something in the steel sector. But yes, for the downstream products and upstream products, probably uh, that could also be looked at in, in oh. your industry. Aditya, my view is, uh, you know, um, you're right because steel is, is a capital-intensive industry. It has a long gestation period. So setting up steel industry, but obviously you, you need not set up a blast furnace always. You can really go for something else, uh, smaller units, electric arc furnaces, etc. But the bigger thing is that um, I don't understand why the legislation comes with a specific time span. Uh, 
and then they in peace meals they keep on extending one year and now people are talking about in the next budget they possibly might extend now in case if, if the bigger purpose happens to be a uh, generation of employment opportunity opportunities having a force multiplier effect mm. on on economy then in that case mopping up tax revenues is 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 low in the uh, you know hierarchy of government's needs because the spillover effects of uh, uh, of generating economic growth is much much more now here also and my earlier experience if you remember 32 ac investment allowance they had earlier straight jacketed within 2 years it had to be done within 2 years and that was becoming very very onerous then they came up with a, another amendment now in this case when you say manufacturing or production has to start um, i can see things falling within the cracks um you know whether the machinery has been installed whether it has started making productions whether there is a trial run coming whether it has been capitalized in the books of account these things can uh, if for various industries this can become a huge issue and then this can lead to litigation now in in countries like singapore etc you will see important notifications or amendments like this in law are supported by huge circulars where all possible scenarios are dissected and then they are giving you a, a sort of a guidance as to how to go about it now here if your intent is good you want to do within timelines and there are certain things which is ensuring that your production actually uh, is set up uh, before the deadline but is actually happening after you are missing out the on the entire thing and the entire project goes for a toss <laughs> so i believe there there has to be a, a a methodology or a way to ensure and i don't know how to do it but there can be ways and means to supplement this sort of an investment activity by by addressing the riders which can come across and 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 clarifying those positions to the assessors umit your closing thoughts on this issue yeah i think i i i fully agree with uh, mr sood uh, i mean you know, see you see this uh, you know concessional regime of 15% in light of you know various pli schemes that government has introduced obviously people have uh, you know bid or applied for the pli schemes now between the bid and and the actual setup we have this covid wave so i think the government should have possibly you know industry was harping for a two year extension and even if they would have given the two year extension with the pli with the make in india uh, i think uh, government would, would not have lost uh, any significant uh, way you know the spin off benefit of uh, new manufacturing set off and you know what a whatever is the trickle down effect on the entire economy would have been uh, large enough uh, to warrant an extension of two years that would have provided more impetus to you know a larger segment uh, to you know avail of this concessional uh, regime <clears throat> as as many other panelists here, over here uh, would have experienced that you know availing of this benefit is not a easy easy uh, task because especially in in some industries uh, where you have an existing setup to you know set up a new company you know, there are a lot of uh, interlinkages and and those interlinkages how do you iron those out is not a very easy thing to do Yes, yes, Omesh. Uh, with this, I would want to move to the third question, and I know this is one question uh, where the whole industry would be crying foul, which is dividend from foreign companies. Now, the government has now repealed the concessional tax rate of fifteen percent on dividends received by Indian companies from their subsidies overseas. Uh, the objective, what it says, is wants to bring it at par with dividend what it received from domestic subsidies, domestic companies, or. in a sense it means a dividend from foreign associates and subsidy would no longer enjoy the special tax rate in this context the indian parent would now have to continue to have an option of effectively lowering its dividend tax i would go in case of choosing the atm section having said this do you think that the proposed amendment would disincentivize indian companies from repatriating dividends from overseas subsidies into india especially in cases where the indian parent do not contemplate declaring dividends to shareholders well most of the corporates do have that policy of a regular dividend flow and the uh, money which you receive from foreign dividends would be a lesser value than the amount of dividends you declare generally but still nevertheless there is a compelling reason that you have to distribute dividends there further in the long run does this whole mindset of the government to increase the levy on foreign dividend pave the way for indian corporates to redesign their overseas structures and reintroduce ihc kind of structures 
which are not so much in the liking because you could easily bring the money enjoy a concessional tax rate so there was a oh, huge amount of revenues for the uh, for for the government um i think this is this is not the this is a backward step you were very right people do not actually uh, fully uh, give the dividends outside and avail for atm and there is a certain portion of the dividends which are kept by the company for growth purposes also uh, i think this is in a way uh, a backward step uh, but it is more driven by generating revenues for the government uh, than anything else but what if you are talking about um, redesigning of uh, uh, structures i don't think that is the case because most of the outbound investments especially in the indian corporate sector have been a miserable failures um, apart from uh, these companies who are doing businesses outside and generating a lot of wealth there thank you mr so so you see uh, this is a retroactive not a very progressive step but a, a yes not a very progressive pradeep what what your thoughts please i i think so as a at a headquarter level you are so invested outside Uh, what is your Aditya, take? Aditya, <clears throat> this uh, you know this provision. We would uh, I would like to appreciate the the need of the R when this was introduced and the benefit we had of this provision, mm. uh, because the intent was very very different. You know, as a as an industry, we were we used to eagerly look forward to each year's finance act to uh, to extend the sunset because this provision came with a sunset clause of only one year, and this provision had an immense. positive impact on the balance of payment immense positive impact on the balance of payment the intent itself was completely different so each uh, finance act we used to just rec- uh, you know represent ask that kindly extend the sunset clause and 2014 was a very delightful year when the entire sunset clause provisions was deleted and it became a perennial provision that now this because the intent altogether was different and if you see the history before that these all these foreign dividends were taxed at 30% at full rate while the domestic dividends because had a different uh, taxing tenure so uh, the intent i'm sure uh, government and the policy uh, you know mechanism because now the balance of payment uh, all the underlying things have changed but the positive impact which this provisions had in past will be appreciated and maybe relooked into it it had a very very specific objective with which this provision was introduced uh, we had a very positive experience of this and as far as structures uh, these are concerned there are larger commercial considerations objectives which determine the consideration this may not be a pivotal play a pivotal role as far as the structures are concerned but the specific objective i i request that that, that specific objective may be considered uh, reconsidered about this provision So Pradeep, it was quite a balance. considering uh, you know the kind of cash which is generated overseas uh, subsidies which, which is good enough for us to pass on to our shareholders uh, uh, in india and we are a dividend paying company every year so that way you know our cash flows are aligned uh, mm-hmm. so to say that that way we find it a little neutral but yeah uh, for uh, for 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 corporates uh, like as mr pravin sur said which has got uh, you know cash locked up because of uh, you know successful uh, acquisition or successful uh business model so overseas then probably you know this window of uh, uh you know few months or two months uh, has to be utilized to kind of bring that money in india without uh, paying out to public uh, under atm yeah so i think that will uh, be a small window uh, wherein you know corporate could use that window to kind of bring that money in and without uh, paying it out and use it for uh, use in india and at the same time the government will make out of it rightly said rahul this two month window most of the many of the corporates will be making the most of yeah naresh 
Yeah, I think that probably for the uh, as Rahul uh, rightly mentioned, probably for the companies uh, who are uh, actually paying the dividend, it uh, it tends to be on the neutral side. But uh, just thinking aloud, uh, in terms of uh, in terms of as uh, Mr. Mitra mentioned that the intention with which this provision was introduced way back in eleven twelve. the intention was always you know to get this uh, repatriation into the country and now when we see that uh, more and more thrust is being uh, uh, being made on uh, make in india to increase the capex plan or to you know kind of uh, have those uh, economy up and running by having the goods manufactured in india probably government uh, government can think of uh, on lines in order to in order to have these achieved by the corporates uh, getting the cash uh, in in form of dividend uh, from from foreign uh, associates would make sense for them to achieve the ultimate objective otherwise probably the companies will always uh, make that cost benefit analysis in terms of getting the money from foreign companies vis-a-vis probably borrowing and uh, putting it uh, putting it in the manufacturing facility what makes more sense purely from tax uh, you know tax uh, perspective umesh your closing statement on this yeah i think uh, you know my my sense is that you know you look at it in this way i think some of the panel members have clearly said that india has not produced too many indian mnc's which which have successfully uh, invested outside india and and have, have profitable except maybe the tech space the pharma space a little bit here and there on the manufacturing side so personally i believe that you know this is a little bit of tinkering that we keep on seeing happen from from the bureaucrat and there is a little bit of uh, you know the the bureaucrat uh, mindset which is which is coming into play mm-hmm. you you try and create a, a situation where corporates can plan with certainty uh, you had a regime where you know from a one year to year extension it was kept perennial now if some corporate has planned on the, that basis now you suddenly change the uh, you know change the whole whole game uh, while there is this atm window which is available but give flexibility to the corporate to decide what is appropriate for them a 15% concessional tax rate under 115 bbd Uh, doesn't doesn't alter you know your grand plans uh, in terms of your overall uh, budget so why tinker you know on small small uh, provisions also there are enough complexities in terms of even if you avail the benefit of atm if there is a withholding tax in, in the source country whether that uh, foreign tax credit is available or no there is lot of uncertainty uh, rather most most legal view that uh, you will not get the foreign tax credit yes so it's a tax it, leakage yeah I, and therefore i would i would believe this is a retrograde uh, 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 step possibly properly represented if the government reconsiders i think it will make industry happy good i i also personally agree with your view umesh uh, we are almost uh, through with the time i would just uh, open the forum for one last question and i would request each of you to just answer this for in 20 seconds and i will start with mr sud yeah. what over to in the budget which you the in the tax proposal what you could find a miss which is there um so the miss in my view when they are talking about atmanirbhar bharat and um, a huge amount of focus on production and capex uh not giving incentive for r and d i am aware of the fact that there is a rationalization of tax rates which is very welcome but now they have to follow it with precise amendments and r and d is something which is extremely important for a country like india if they want this to be made as a manufacturing hub so r and d incentive is, is certainly a mess the second miss happens to be uh, covid expenditure now this uh, increasing propensity of the government to you know lump on the corporate csr expenditure but not making it tax deductible and there is not a word on the expenses made on covid account by the corporates that is surprising and you know companies like ours tatas they they have been expending a lot uh, you know on this people who have got affected and and the type of expenditure which we have undertaken and not a word on whether it is going to be a deductible expenditure or not the recipients yes and there has been for 12 months we have been giving uh, annuity for them lifelong till mm. till the the deceased employee would have got superannuated 
So I think in the interest of all this, uh, that would have been welcome also. Uh, so precise policy making is something which is uh, uh, what we expect uh, going forward. But uh, R and D is something which needs to be have uh, uh, should be the focus of the government. Yes, when I think so, when you say R and D, uh, who better than uh, Mr. Verma can understand the pain because pharma is the highest has the highest expenditure on R and D compared to all other sectors. On an average, yeah, uh, she, uh, yeah, 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 Aditya, but it's a, we were feeling that uh, you know it's a chicken egg situation. Now, the thing is, government last year had uh, come up with the new tax regime of a lower tax rate of twenty two percent. Yeah. And I don't know the corporate which has gone to the new tax regime and then they you know bring up this R and D benefit in the old regime. You know, I think it could not even one cannot fathom like how will they bring it in the new regime with the, the old regime. So having said so, you know uh, that is the you know perpetually which I have in mind on this R and D issue while the association uh, has put forth this point. But having said that, uh, you know I was looking some more clarity you know around the fifty six two related. Uh, uh, you know, adjustment and questions which now, you know, come in every, uh, you know, questionnaire which has become a picture. Like, you know, 14A, which is more or less done its life of creating the nuances and the, you know, litigation thing. Now, 56-2 is the next, uh, you know, bone in the flesh, which will just come your way, waste your time, invest your energies and kind of nothing, uh, you know, going to come to the government or to anyone else. So it is something which is like a new toy which is given to the you know this uh, junior officers who is going to waste your time and waste their time. <laughs> very right, very right, Rahul. I know that's the next big thing for the tax officers to trouble you, and it's a quite an ambiguous section and it keeps on enlarging and enlarging with new subsections keep getting added to it uh, year on year. I'm surprised other than the digital tax there was not much of an addition in fifty six. But uh, but I think so. This will become a very long section. It's known as other sources, but it will become the longest section probably. Naresh, your thoughts? Uh, anything which you? Okay, yeah. I think I uh, think at uh, in in bits and uh, pockets, government uh, has been doing to some extent uh, favor favor the corporate sector. Like for example, they have been coming out with uh, various. Uh, PLI related schemes, which which actually gives you uh, the desired benefit in terms of setting up the facilities. Having said that, uh, and uh, what I've seen over the years is that uh, uh, there is always uh, there is always an expectation uh, uh, from the corporates or from uh, the other taxpayers that some clarity would emerge in relation to quite a lot of uh, vexed issues for which uh, there have been litigations which have been long pending. So my my thought process was why why can't uh, it be clarified uh, you know at an opportune point in time and why should one wait for the budget to come and then uh, have those seek those clarities mm -hmm. can can there be can there be a you know sunset clause around uh, till what time litigation you know, can can continue because we have seen um, in many corporates litigation as old as uh, you know some some 95 96 uh, related uh, year being pending can can there be something which which can actually you know because uh, thrust we have seen that uh, there has there has been a lot of thrust to put around uh, uh, the uh, curbing the protracted uh, litigations and all those stuff but uh, practically speaking can't see that uh, happening on ground with uh, already pending uh, past long litigations. Thank you, Narish. Thank you. Umesh uh, and Ranjit, first Umesh and Ranjit, anything you would want to add to this in your wish list, which you would have wanted to see? And I'll just give you both of you 15 seconds. I'm so sorry, we already run out of time. I Umesh. think, I think the, the, the one thing that upsets me is that, you know, there is this tinkering happening. A lot of judicial decisions are being overturned. This is not a good trend at all. I think in terms of education says government uh, has has you know made it very clear that there will not be any retrospective amendments but they are still trying to bring uh, amendment through the back door by clarifying that you know this was always the intention i think uh, you know education says is not 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 something big but uh, absolutely no no need for government to bring in retrospective uh, amendments or amendments which can create a retrospective hangover for uh, tax assessors I agree with you, Ramesh. We should have we should have let this issue 
go up to supreme court and let it decide probably in favor of the revenue or against the revenue we should have let it happen when you drafted a law everyone read the law understood and interpreted the law you had your notifications we read all of it we interpreted it and we took the claims now you realize oh there will be a beneficial it may be read as benefit let me go and clarify well you know that they are favorable rulings that means large number of corporates is very unfair but but we got to live with it uh, ranjit what do you last i'll i'll have the last word so yes. uh, just taking off on that point which which umesh also just mentioned retrospective i think we've seen quite a few of those in the gst law as well and uh, including in the customs law but i may say this that in the context of gst law some of them were necessary because we have to admit there were design flaws in the gst law and uh, they've addressed those okay i mean i don't believe it would be possible to sort of carry on without having addressed those uh, rightly or wrongly uh, is you know maybe a debate to be had but uh, those were necessary so not all retrospective amendments were you know possibly uh, draconian in that sense but yes uh, quite a few in the gst and in the customs law as well uh but one of the sort of misses that i think uh you know i would sort of highlight and and you know like like you asked on the wish list is is that the redressal mechanism the litigation redressal mechanism in the gst space i think that needs an urgent relook uh mm-hmm. we have here in the direct tax laws a sort of arrangement whereby we will not file appeals and we will wait for you know decisions to come through from the higher forum before we go and litigate it at at all and sundry but uh, in the gst space we are looking at a absence of a tribunal and that is now being felt immensely you know you can't turn up at the knocking at the high court's door every other day you can't be going into the supreme court and letting them tell you you know this is how the provision is this is how it should be seen that's really unfortunate and as we have set out with a new law i think that was something which we could have gotten right um, I, th- i think that's a clear clear miss four years Four years, we are running a lot day in day out. Every transaction, we have a GST implication, and we don't have a proper intermediary. You know, something between a, high, a court and a and an officer, a proper redressal forum. I I I don't want to use the harsh words, but it's it's a shame. It's a shame. I I agree with you. So yeah. So that that's that's something that I think should have been attended to, but unfortunately. Thank you, Ranjit. The uh pradeep i'm sorry i missed you you want to add a point or so i just i'm sorry in the rotation i missed you. you want to add a point the uh i think many of the points are covered one important point what we saw from the service sector service sector has always been uh one of the best performer in our economy so as a catalyst for further growth uh some of the provisions to uh, to help reorganization tax neutral reorganization in the service sector would have been welcome as as well as we have seen that the that the ministry of corporate affairs have came up with good uh, ease of doing business by delisting uh, delisting of the listed subsidiaries of a parent of a listed parent so tax neutrality provisions for such uh, uh, reform uh, was an ask of the industry which i think we have to wait further for that to come these were two important miss from my side i think i fully agree you know 72 a provisions uh, to be extended to service sector was was a yes crying need it, it it would be a catalyst for the for the further growth and as well as some of the reforms like uh, you know when, with the maturity of the business sometimes we are saddled with a listed subsidiary of a listed parent uh, so good reforms were there so we are waiting uh, the endorsement under the tax laws which will make it workable thank you pradeep thank you thank you to all the panelists thank you ranjit thank you umesh this has been a great session And thanks uh, aditya thank, thank you very much thank you aditya thank, thank you aditya everyone. And thank, you. Yeah. thank you thank you thank you bye bye we'll back to you again before we move to the next session thank you for to all our speakers uh, our experts on direct taxes and indirect taxes for making the session so informative so we will close the session here uh, for our uh, facebook viewers for in the other platforms it, the streaming will continue we'll just take a couple of minutes break in facebook to get it relive again so i'll give you a heads up when the facebook is relive but however uh, the other uh, streaming is like it's continuing so uh, we would request aditya to stay on for uh chairman of medica group of hospitals who is also the past president of the bengal chamber will be joining shortly 
So Aditya, I'll give you a heads up when we are uh, we live again on Facebook, and you can commence the session on industry perspectives on the union budget 2023. So we'll I'll hold on, and I'll just wait for your signal. Hello, so welcome uh, to the industry perspectives on union budget 22-23. This session is being moderated by Mr. Aditya Hans, partner of Group Advisors LLP and as panelists we have Mr. Vinod Kumar Jain, chairman of Safe Game Industries, Dr. Olof Roy, chairman Medical Group of Hospitals and past president in Gold Chamber will be joining shortly. Aditya, you will request to please take the session forward. Thank you, thank you, Angana. Uh, well, I think so. I will start by first introducing Mr. Jain. Uh, and I think so, Mr. Jain needs no introduction. ITN in his family and graduated with BTEC honors degree in chemical engineering from IIT, Kharagpur in 1970. Post which he joined in the Sun Lever. And then uh, around 1980, he started his detergent manufacturing company, Safe Chain, and presently known as Shantina Detergents in uh, 1980 in Kolkata. Today, the detergent, power brand, Safed, and dishwash brand, Sparkle, are household names in Eastern India. His latest accomplishments include launching successful private labels, Cyclone and Scrubble, in the home care category on Amazon India. So I welcome Mr. Jain. And uh, uh, Angana, Mr. Roy has also joined. Yes, I'm here with you, Mr. Atya. Hello, Mr. Roy. Hi, hi. How are you? Yes. Mr. Roy, again, I am feeling embarrassed to introduce everyone in Eastern India. Thank you, Mr. Roy, for taking this, I think the privilege of taking this, introducing you. Mr. Roy is the Chairman and Magic Director uh, of Medica, a group of hospitals. And uh, he specializes in the nuclear cardiology from AIMS, but uh, over the last 20 years, he has evolved into a reputed hospital management specialist with unsurpassed technical expertise and a visionary outlook by virtue of having established numerous healthcare facilities across the country, including four major heart hospitals and numerous other multi-speciality healthcare setups in India. So we have these two distinguished panelists who will, uh, with whom we'll discuss uh, the way they perceive the budget to be from their respective sectors. One is the healthcare sector and one is from the FMCG sector. Uh, before, before we move, uh, I would, the way we'll run this uh, session is, uh, I will just put up a presentation. Uh, just one second. I'll put up a presentation and then I will run it for 10 minutes and then I'll leave it to the sector experts to comment because this is my personal perspective about the budget from an economy perspective. Just one second. Just give me a second, I'm just opening the presentation.
here is the synchronization. Yes, is my is it uh, I'm gonna get it confirmed is my screen uh, visible yes it is visible sir thank you very much thank you thank you uh, I will take 10 minutes and uh, and then I'll hand it over to the sector experts this is my take and uh, if I move to just once again The central government presented the second union budget with in the uh, wake of this COVID-19 pandemic, where the whole world has been affected. But the world is a different place. What has it brought about? It's changed, brought about change in technology, consumer behavior, supply chain, geopolitics, climate change. Everything is being perceived differently today. Faced with these challenges, the government's immediate response was to cushion the negative impact of the vulnerable sections of the society. The government moved away from the by default approach, which is the waterfall approach, where it sets up a committee, it plans, it discusses, prepare reports. Here, instead of a waterfall approach, it adopted an agile approach. Just get onto the job, react immediately, be flexible in responses, look for the vulnerable, how you can support the vulnerable societies immediately. And government in line with other bodies, if you see, the budget estimate is 9.2%. Probably that's an outcome of its quick reaction. I don't know. That's what everyone says. Uh, or probably the dip was so low that the denominator is a little lower base. But that is what it is expected. And IMF is also confirmed around something around 8.7%. Now, all of this data definitely reflects a positive, uh, is on a positive note. And if you look at the graph out here, there was one dip, a very severe, a V-shaped graph, which was there. So V-shaped recovery of GDP and GBA is deeper in case of the first wave as compared to the second wave. That means we have learned to live with the COVID. Rather, if you see, there was a more severe impact on the mortality, on the mortality numbers, but in the second wave. But, but if you see, the second wave impact on the economy was lesser because we learned to live with that. And probably the third wave, you will, you will realize when the data comes out, it has even been flatter. It's not so much a V-shaped curve. Now, with this positive note, I'll move to the next slide. Similar observation, if you see, uh, I just, yeah. Now, if you look at the industrial production, similar observation is, is visible when you look at the index of industrial production. A steeper V-shaped curve can be observed in the first wave, whereas a minimal dip is observed when you look at the second wave. The same is account of the steps taken by the government to boost the demand, capex expenditure, steps taken uh, uh, in support of the Atman Nirbhar Bharat policies and all of that in the second wave. So you can see that that, that disturbance of that steep V is not there in the second wave. Now, if I move to the next slide here, if I look at the construction sector, the rising capital expenditure, what did government do? It kept on, in the, at least in this period of the second wave, it did a lot of capex expenditure. This rising a capital expenditure by the government on infrastructure an uptick in the housing cycle has been responsible for reviving the construction sector. This has allowed the consumption and production of steel and cement to be high. The demand is expected to further accelerate with the budgetary announcements of PM Gati Shakti Yojanas, which include construction of 25,000 kilometers of national highways, PM Avas Yojana and other CapEx schemes. Again, something on a positive note that the bad is over. And these are all statistical data which has come up in the economic survey of the economy. So I'm first going to speak about the positive and then I'm going to have my reservations also. Now, if I look at the services sector, service sector, which accounts for more than half of the Indian economy, was mostly impacted in the disturbances, especially for the activities that need human contact. While most of the sub-service categories have returned pre-COVID, but the hospitality sector, if you see on the right-hand side, still suffered. But if you look at the left-hand side, that other than the hotel occupancy where a direct human interface was not required, they have somehow recovered. The dip was not so deep in the second wave and probably third wave, it will be flat also. Now, if I move to the next slide, the GDP forecast 
and I, it's not that the India is coming up with numbers. IMF and every other body has come up with a number, probably a 0.5 year and a 0.5 there. They've also confirmed that this will continue. The 9% will continue for 22. And for 23, it will still be 7%. And in each of these three years, that is 21, 22, 23, it will be the fastest growing economy. Not India, but all the world uh, bodies, trade, all the world, uh, like the World Economic Forum or the IMF, everyone has acknowledged this fact. Sounds very positive. Like, rather, if you look at China, they had a 2.3% growth in the GDP last year when India was at a minus 7.3. This year, they will have an 8. India will have 9. They will dip to 4.8 and there will be 5.2, whereas India will continue in the range of 9 and 8. So, so something positive to talk about. But what worries me? What worries me is that even though the key national indicators and sectors are all are showing sign of revival, going back to the pre-pandemic and even more, the growth in the banking credit has remained sluggish. Somehow, government has not been able to create that environment. Probably the scare which has got created, the banks are not lending, the PSU banks were a huge, huge repository, they are not lending, and the corporates are also reluctant because the covenants are very stringent. So it indicates that these banks are still cautious by lending to the private sector based on the past experience not a very good sign for the economy. It will, this growth will not be sustainable if that happens. Cause of concern. Second is the biggest worrying uh, concern is if you see the real growth, which everyone is claiming will be 8.79 or 9.2. Interestingly, no one is speaking and I didn't read anywhere about the nominal growth. Nominal growth is actually 17%. That means where does the delta go? The 17 minus 9 or 17 minus 8.7. That all of that goes towards inflation. And this is worrisome. And yeah. probably we have not realized we're not facing the impact of inflation today. So much we are getting to get the vibes of it, but not feeling it. But if you see the different gap between the CPI and the WPI, the moment it will it has already affected the WPI, and in the next cycle, probably it starts affecting the CPI, the consumers. And we'll start seeing inflation in the subsequent quarters. Probably this quarter and the subsequent quarter we may see even further inflation. Well, all of that growth may go towards inflation. That's that's not a good sign. This is something. So there is optimism. India, everyone is optimistic about India. The world, the global bodies are optimistic about India. Look at the FDI, look at the Forex reserves, look at all these signs of production, look at how India has matured from the first wave to the second wave. And I'm sure the third wave data will be even better, which is not yet out. But but there are worrying concerns. And why? I will, I will highlight why I say so. Now, if I look at the Atman Nirbhar Bharat, which India wants to push, and here is the worrying concern. Here, first of all, it's very good. If you see the amount of exports, which was there in 1920, if you look at the graph, the first part of the graph on the left-hand side, that were the pre-pandemic levels of exports. There was a dip in 2021. But in 2022, it is surpassed what it was in. So it's crossed the pre-pandemic levels. It's a very good sign. I agree. But I'll move to the next slide. In, has India been able to address the issue of Atman Nirbhar Bharat? If you look, while the overall exports provide a positive outlook, one needs to be mindful that there are only 10 products. Around 46% of the total, 46% of the total exports are there. And they're just done to seven countries. The top 10 products are petroleum, precious pearls, precious stones, iron and steel, pharma, gold, organic chemicals, electrical machinery. Now, if I move to the import section. Now, if again here, it's very interesting that as the pandemic embedded, India witnessed revival in the domestic demand resulting in strong import growth. The merchandise imports grew at a rate of 68% to that is around 443 billion in April to December 21, while commodities accounts for India's major exports and manufactured, manufactured products account for 60%. Well, and, well, India cannot replace the commodity imports, crude oil, gold, silver, you cannot replace that. Coal, you cannot because India has thermax coal, it doesn't have, th it has thermal coal, it doesn't have the other cooking coal. So, Commodities cannot be that 40% is a reality. But to address that 60%, we should look at what is the import data. And I would show that in the next slide. If you look at 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10, 
This is roughly 15% of the 60% of the imports. Government has tried to address point number seven vegetable oils, that is 3%. But there's a, again, it has tried to address electrical components, but it has tried to address uh, some of the here and there through the PLI schemes, but not significantly six, nine, 10, these are not being addressed. It is interesting to see that China continues to be the big major source of, we import maximum from China, which is around 15%. And on slide 11, we can observe that China is one of the top three countries to which India exports its goods, but trade balance is heavily tilted. We export to China, we import from China, but the trade imbalance is huge. So in this context, and with all the PLI and all of that, which has been announced, that there is a sense of optimism. There is a sense of optimism. The world is optimistic about it, but there is an inflation which is there. There is a level of borrowings from the banks is very limited. So there are positives and negatives. And with this, I would want to invite uh, Mr. Jain and Mr. Roy to speak about the sectors, specific sectors. That Because if I look at it from, I, and I am a chartered accountant, when I look at this data, there is a half-baked sense of optimism, but there is a concern also, looking at the credit, looking at the imports, looking at what we are importing, that's huge. And we speak about Atmanirvan Bharat, but there are no clear targeted schemes PLI has been there, but it doesn't address, does it go and target in a target manner, address the value, the imports which are very high from China. Because see, you need to import from Saudi. You need to import from UAE. That's, you, you cannot be a state of denial because that they are, you're already importing from them as petroleum products. And interestingly, you're exporting a huge value to them, specifically to UAE. So it's somewhere getting balanced out. But with this data, I, I request Mr. Jain to first come on board and, uh, and, and give his views that how, how does he see sector fairing and has the has the comment attended to the concerns of the FMCG sector? And uh, Mr. Jain, please. Thank you. Thank you so much, Aditya. Am I audible? Yes, Mr. Jain. Yeah. Uh, I'll be talking on the fast-moving consumer goods, the FMCG products. And uh, the as... As one is aware, the fast-moving consumer goods sector is the fourth largest sector in the Indian economy with a market share of 110 billion in 2020. This sector has a CARG of 14% and is expected to reach a market size of USD 220 billion by 2025. The urban segment contributes 55% while the rural segment contributes 45% of the revenue share. Within the FMCG sector, the household and personal care account for 50% of sales, the health care contributes 31% and the foods and beverages account for 19% of the overall sales. 50% of the rural consumers are now aged below 25 years the rural lifestyle mirroring urban aspirations, lifestyles, and purchases. And uh, because of the increased digitization and internet penetration, this has enhanced awareness, choices, and exploratory approaches. The job losses, the pay cuts, have suppressed the consumption trends. And at the bottom of the pyramid, the consumption is still stressed. The Boston Consulting Group, the BCG report 202021 states, household consumption growth is likely to be delayed by two years and will reach levels predicted by, for 2028 in 2030. There are several problems that are bugging the FMCG industry, which need to be addressed immediately, which of course have not found place in the budget, and I would like to highlight the major problems here. The last few months has seen astronomical increase in the cost of inputs, the raw materials as well as the packaging materials. Inputs like soda ash, linear alkyl benzene, commonly known as LAB, palm oil, which form the backbone of the health and personal care segment, have seen cost increases to the tune of 30 to 70%, 30 to 
there is a big gap in the domestic supplies vis-a-vis -vis the domestic requirements of key raw materials like soda ash, linear alkyl benzene, palm oil, etc., etc., etc. And this, have, this was also true for other um, industries as well. There is an immediate need to bridge this gap and or put in R&D work to find replacement of the said raw materials. While the prices of palm oil are showing, showing signs of holding, soda ash and lap show no signs of bait. Apart from this, the supply chain disruptions caused by skyrocketing global sea freight, internal diesel fuel hike line, lead freight hikes, and the import blocker anti-dumping duties on many items like soda ash, lab and other raw materials cause a nowhere scenario. The inflationary pressures on raw materials, packaging materials, and supply chain disruptions has thus led to prices, increase in prices to consumers by average 5 to 12 percent and some as high as 33 percent over the last two quarters with, a, with another 4 to 10 percent hike in, on the anvil across FMCG players. The high consumption cost together with continued COVID scare has started to pull back part of the consumption revival, restricting demand. So these are the problems that the industry has been facing all along, I mean, uh, last, especially the last few months. And uh, in light of the above, I take this opportunity to express my heartiest, heartiest congratulations to the Honorable Finance Minister for coming out with a highly progressive budget containing demand containing demand or or consumption generation measures in order to help give a major boost to the economy the noteworthy measures taken by the government include investments in infrastructure and housing development record number of measures to enhance the livelihood of farmers and boost their agriculture and other incomes steps taken to boost rural income initiatives for revival of the msmes huge hike in capital expenditure and uh, i think all this will go a long way to boost the economy the record gst collection of rupees 140986 crores during january 2022 is enough proof of the fact that the government is taking the right approach with these forward looking measures taken by the government in the budget i am confident that this would go a long way to increase the demand of FMCG products as well and give a big boost to the economy. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Jain. Uh, uh, so I carry that there's a sense of optimism. You see most of the optimism in the budget this time. Uh, very good. Uh, although I had some reservation and I continue to have a reservation, there are some larger macroeconomic factors which seem to be have slipped the government's mind, but nevertheless, you cannot keep everyone happy. Mr. Roy, I would uh, want to invite you and uh, uh, in the context of what I shared and in the context of further what Mr. Jain has clarified, given his sector's perspective, we would like to see uh, how your sector would be faring. Is there enough for you in the budget? There should have been more. Your views on this. Thank you, Mr. Hans. <clears throat> the country has been battling with COVID pandemic for the last two years. So we thought that this budget should be ideally a, a health-centered budget, but it wasn't to be. See, the inequalities have increased. A lot of people have been pushed below poverty line because of loss of uh, uh, jobs, and uh, they have been pushed below because they have spent a lot of money. Uh, a reasonable guess is that 70,000 crore have been spent by people in staying healthy due to pandemic. And uh, they should have been treated, they ought to be treated by the government, but that was not so. Because 70% of healthcare is in, in the hands of the private uh, players. Healthcare, so very fact that government has focused on digital healthcare, shows that finally healthcare sector is being considered as a prerequisite to ensure economic well-being of the country. That is commendable. India's growth is estimated to be 9.7%, and healthcare will play a major role in the boost. Economic survey indicates health spending has significantly increased to 2.1% of GDP. But what is to be noted 
that this includes spending on water, sanitation, and nutrition as well. It is important to view the outlay purely for healthcare delivery schemes and initiatives, which have not seen any increase from last year's expenditure. And remember that public health is very important for us to prevent the pandemic in the future. If we do not uh, address it, we will do it at our loss. Given that budget this year has focused on infrastructure and capital expenditure, capital expenditure, the budget for Pradhan Mantri Aishman Bharat Health Infrastructure Mission under central and state head is a very welcome move. This would help provide the much needed specific focus on health infrastructure development in cities beyond metro. B, C, D uh, category of cities probably will get a long-term development of the sector. However, it is important to note, very important point here, that healthcare delivery organizations have a long decision period and would need financial support for operational expenses like medical staff, equipments, etc. in the initial years. The, uh, that is something which has not been addressed. So you may create infrastructure, but it will not get utilized. That's something that the government should have thought of. The decision to start an open platform for national digital health ecosystem is a welcome move. This is in line with the overall digitization of the economy, especially when coupled with enabling 5G services across the country. We know that, that telemedicine has got a great push in pandemic and government has continued pushing it, especially mental health, 23 center, Neemans, triple IT of Bangalore, they're getting together. That's a very welcome move. The healthcare providers heartily welcome the government focus on mental health. This was something which was needed and our, our people, children who have stayed at home have suffered a lot. So much mental health centers of excellence is a much applauded move by the government. That's right. But if you go the fine print, the outlay has just increased by 10 or 12 crore. They're not enough. So the, is the, uh, are you going to walk your talk with just increase of 10 crore? Uh, which on a on an outlay of 580 crore, it has gone up by 13 crore, so around 610 crore or something. So is that uh, uh, what has changed? So we'll have to watch it and see it very carefully. It was expected that the government will look at increasing the public health care expenditure above 2.5 percent of GDP. Overall, the proposals made the budget 22-23 should have made quality health care accessible and affordable. At the end of the day. The way the healthcare has been politicized, everybody wants to pay for healthcare. The very fact that Ayushman Bharat Jan Aro Biojana, which government has started, they have they have provided an outlay of six thousand crore, and last year they have used only three thousand crore. That means there is something fundamentally wrong in using the money, because don't tell me that there are no poor people in this country who need healthcare. There are. There, there is a need, an unmet need, but the very fact that you have made a scheme in such a manner, it is not being implemented. They could have resolved it, they could have corrected it. So the bigger hockey would have joined hand and most of the money of Dhan Mandi Jan Arug Yojana is going to the government hospitals. So uh, the growth is not happening. The government should have focused more on primary healthcare investment. Because the grassroots where they live, they should have been addressed there. And given the sector national priority status, I mean, after two years of pandemic, we have missed the bus. If you don't give a national priority status, then when will you give it? As was done for IT sector, the same push should have gone for healthcare. Incentives for research as well as training and upskilling of workforce were needed, along with the focus on preventive care to tackle the growing burden of non-communicable diseases. Most industry demands have not been met in this budget. So the push on the budget is towards the uh, digitization side. But what is the point of doing digitization if the people are unhealthy and not alive? So the uh, health sector has been reasonably disappointed, especially after battling COVID, a lot of expectation from the government to really address it in the right spirit. I think what has happened in our mind, what we are thinking, that because they were so concerned about economic growth, that they pushed the healthcare behind. But there's no growth without healthcare. There's no, healthcare is the prime requisite for education, for economics. That's something 
they forgot. Thank you. Very well said, Mr. Roy. Very well said. Uh, probably uh, you pointed out very nicely that uh, in the run up for the economic growth, the GDP, and having reflecting good numbers, probably we may have achieved, uh, or we are in the path of Atman Nirva Bharat, if not in three years, five years, an optimum number. But probably we ha may have ignored uh, two sectors, and I would add one more sector to it is education. There is talk about it, but I don't see the money being spent. There is talk that you can set up an autonomous university in uh, the gift city. There is talk about things here and there, but the amount of money which you should come dole out, the money we should dole out for healthcare sector, that has not happened. But yes, uh, uh, that way, if you say you you when you when you have ten rupees in your pocket and you and you have twenty places to spend, so you have to prioritize something. Probably government has ignored. I hope uh, they, it becomes a priority, it becomes a need of the art uh, in, in, in a year or two. Because if you ask me, it was your sector, the healthcare sector, which kept our country, you know, when, when the second wave was there and the way people were running health skelter for a place in the hospital, it was your sector who gave space to all the patients, who accommodated the patients. So, so definitely a salute to your sector. But yes, it, it, it probably did not get its undue So there's something which is due to your sector, but I'm sure it will happen. Your voices will be heard by the government. I'm sure about that. Mr. Jain, uh, over yeah. to you again. Closing statement uh, before we close the session. Yeah. You were very optimistic and I'm also optimistic, at least on the industrial production part, because the way uh, I'm seeing growth, the way I'm seeing numbers, Mr. Jain, I can tell you they are very, very promising. But obviously with some reservations, on the inflationary part, because I have many of my clients who are significant exporters. The issue around exports is so much. The cargo prices, the shipping logistics costs, it's actually been debtor into exports. You're not getting containers. There are many issues, many bottlenecks when, when you're looking at a huge level of, you are looking at a PLI, but VLI, you cannot consume all of it. It has to be exported. And when you don't have a clear uh, bandwidth, you know, clear passage for exports, and there are so many bottlenecks around that. But probably not all of it is created by the government. But government should have that initiative to resolve it also. So, Mr. Jain, your closing statement before we close the session for today. Uh, you, you, put up, uh, you put this up so very beautifully that, you know, the exports are going up. But what is going being exported is, you know, is not what should have been exported. The fact of the matter is, the, the as you said, rightly said, the ocean freights, the air freights, the container charges have gone so exorbitantly high that it's not worth exporting. In the mm. process, what has happened is, I would like to add this, in the process, what has happened is, the export obligations are not being met. The mm. EPCG, since you got the EPCG, you know, the, under the EPCG scheme, you purchased a lot of machineries, and these machineries were to deliver goods for to be exported. And their mm. export obligation was six times the, not the Indian value. USD value, yes. which is double. Over the double. years, in the 8-10 years, the USD, which is 40 rupees, has gone to 75 rupees, almost mm -hmm. double. So your export obligations are doubled. Now, these are things where, you know, the government should come out with some solutions. And instead of coming out with solutions, the MEI scheme is bad, you know, scrap. So you come out with some scheme, which is much, much less. Okay. Than how do you how do you take care of these, uh, you know, huge export, um, you know, the ocean freights and all? It's not possible. So these are things, unless I think the basic thing, as you said, rightly said, which was not my topic, so I didn't talk about it. I think this basically the basic, you hit the thing, nail at the right place. These exports, if you really want to become a big, big nation, you have to make sure that your exports are fantastic and you must look at the problems being faced by the exporters. You are not, you know, you want these existing exporters to die. They let them not export obligations. They're getting notices after notices, one after the other. You know, you're not met your export obligation. So please, you pay your, this bank guarantee has to be in cash, etc., etc., etc. But this is not the solution. You have to come out with a solution. You have to become, you know, when you go abroad, you go to any country. You're made in China, made in, made in Thailand, made in Vietnam. And where is made in India? Made in India has to make sure the, if you really become Arthur by Bharat, you have to make sure that you should follow the policies which these countries have followed in order to make sure the exports have gone up 
and if the exports go up, real exports, not the petroleum and all, uh, the, the products, the manufactured products need to be exported. Right, right. right. So that is that is a that would be the real game which the uh, country would do. But unfortunately enough, you know, the uh, we have made several representations on this. You have to change your you know the foreign trade policies. But foreign trade policy now again, you know, the it's like we extended the 20, 15, 20, extended 21, 21 to 22, and it's the same as it is, no changes in the foreign trade policy. How is the nation going to grow? The economic policies. We'll have to cater to this. Thank you. I mean, you put it very beautifully. I must admire it. Thank you, Mr. Jain. And, uh, you know, the cause of the concern which you share, most of my clients share, I can tell you some of them have such wonderful order books standing today. Running into crows and crows. They say they can multiply it by four times. That's the kind of order book. Because there is a tendency to shy away from China today. But India is not able to capitalize on that. And I can see the pain of my clients. But... But I think so, government should have had a more proactive approach of resolving the problem rather than sitting and saying that I'm not troubling you. It's not about tru not troubling me. I know in earlier times there was red tapeism. That is a lot more reduced in this government. But there has to be a proactive approach to make it more progressive. The way China did for its manufacturers, they made it more easy. You make life more easy. Leave aside the red tapeism. You incentivize that process. Or if there's a bottleneck on a commercial aspect, please help resolve them. Participate in that. Stop those notices which are coming to the, under the EPCG scheme. Understand the pain which is happening. There is an order book or give an incentive on the ocean freight. Something has to be done. I don't see that. that that's, that's missing. Mrs. I would like to add here. You see, point is today, the US importers want, do not want to import from China. This is a fact of yes. life. And yes. you could have encashed this opportunity to the maximum advantage of yours. But unfortunately enough, I, I don't see there's some, some you know, Something which has to be taken off the uh, in front of whatever is there in front of the government concerned people. I mean, they have they have that particular thing which is not you know allowing them to see ahead has to be taken off. And yes. then only I think really in, uh, the India will really grow. Exports have to grow. India has to grow. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Roy. Anything? Uh, any closing statement from you as well? Uh, and we'll close the session with this. Yeah, I mean uh, the only thing uh, we like to say that. Uh, uh, when the 70% of uh, healthcare is delivered by the private sector, mm -hmm. the, uh, uh, the government has to really, their responsibility lies in uh, public health. If they can just work on public health and increase their GDP a little bit more and ease of operation, ease of uh, uh, delivering the healthcare uh, by private sector, if they can do that, remove some certain obstacles. See, private sector doesn't depend on the government too much. As long as you don't interfere and don't block us. If you don't block us, we are ready to flourish ourselves because that kind of uh, uh, resilience we have. So yes. I think if they need to focus only on two things, first, that public health, and second, that help us in growing. Like uh, we pay the GST on every item which we bring in. Mm. We pay a, G a custom duty on every item which we buy. But we don't get input credit. That's a so we can't offset our uh, payment. Yes. So uh, that's something. So if they do though. that, it will become cheaper to the people. Your own people will get cheaper services. Yes. yes, yes. But this has been a you know, bone of contention for a long time. A yeah. uh, lot of debate around it. But I believe your, your industry association, you know, specific. But well, everyone says this government listens and they have listened to many of the suggestions, but probably they have. Your, turn, your turn is due in the next time. I hope so. <laughs> thank, hope you, so. thank you. This was a very good session. Great uh, talking to such the wonderful entrepreneurs. And from the East, as I interact with many in the West, the North, but it's so much a pleasure to interact with entrepreneurs in the East. I'm going to over back to you. Uh, thank you. Uh... Mr. Vinod Kumar Jain and Dr. Alok Rai and of course to Aditya. It is a pleasure working with Aditya and the team and Truba Advisors in presenting uh, this program. And yes, we understand the time, I mean the pressures on time of both Dr. Roy and uh, Mr. Jain. So thank you for carving out time. And thank you for all our participants for you know, joining us because your participation is benchmark for any program. So we are closing this session here.
Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you, Agra. Thank you, Bengal Chamber. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Aditya. Bye bye. Thank you.